Good morning, everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? Thank you for uh, jumping out into the snow today. I uh, debated on whether or not we should do this today, but uh, I'm glad we went ahead with it. Hopefully, we'll get out of here before the snow gets even worse. Um, next weekend was not going to be a good option with uh, Easter. To, uh, it's not on? Too far? A little better there. I've introduced myself. My name's Chad Frainer. I'm the director of horticulture. I kind of help uh, with the training of the gu garden guides uh, so that you guys can tour both the, gar the gardens and the park. Um, there are a few people who I could not do any of this without. Um, the Garden Guide Council, who I just want to introduce and have you stand up for just a second so people can recognize who you are. Um, they help me do everything. They do everything for me. <laughs> Be honest. Uh, Estelle Houston, uh, she's our garden chair. Uh, Darlene Trusty is right next to her. Darlene helps out with uh, giving us imagery for everything that we go through on our training tours. Oren Cooley, down here on the front. Oren's our... Uh, our resident docent as well as garden guide, so he helps to transition between the two and it works beautifully. Orange is going to be giving a little presentation later on and also a tour as well at 1230 for those interested. Um, did everybody get an itinerary uh, that was out on the table to talk about the timing that we're going to go through here today? Um, to start off, I just want to give a few announcements of th some of the things that have changed this year or there will be changing. Um, it's incredible right now. The garden is growing. I mean, not just, obviously we can't go outside of our 52 acre footprint um, uh, up on top here, but the amount of space that we're gardening on those 52 acres has increased dramatically in the last two years. Um, it's exciting. It also gives us the opportunity to share it with us, others more than we have in the past. Uh, the gardens are more prominently displayed in uh, Newfield's uh, marketing and promotion. So it's an exciting time to be here. Those of you who have been here for 20, 25 years, I see Ellen just came in, uh, that uh, you can see the changes that have, that have evolved and uh, where we're headed right now. It's, it is very exciting. Uh, the one thing I do want to mention is the museum hours that will be changing here. They start April 1st. Um, they've tried to um, utilize the, the best times where more people can be invited to the museum. Um, in the past, we had hours where if you were retired or weren't working that day, you could get, come in here to see the galleries. Now they're much more accessible. Um, so the new hours will be, Jonathan, throw something at me if I get these wrong. Uh, Sunday, Tuesday, and Wednesday will be from 11 to 5. Um, and then Thursday, Friday, and Saturday will be from 11 to 8. So that gives us a lot more evening hours. Um, it squares up the, the start time on Sundays where it was different before. So it's just much more uniform. These will be our hours from now through October. Um, everything's kind of going by seasons here. At that season, then it'll change into winter lights hours and winter hours. But uh, uh, So those are exciting for us. But with that, our tours will change a little bit, our tour times. Uh, for for walking garden tours. <clears throat> Our walking garden tours will be going Thursday, Friday, and Saturday at 6 o'clock. So we'll do a nice evening tour. This gives people uh, a chance to come in after work. Um, on that last Thursday of the month, either myself or Jonathan will be given a director's tour um, on that 6 o'clock hour. Our Saturday and Sunday walking tours are going to remain the same. Those are going to be at 1 o'clock, um, starting at 1. So those will still meet. Um, the literature is still saying the overlook, but I'm going to have a new sign placed right outside the garden entrance at that circle uh, 
that says garden tours start here. It'll give the time at one o'clock. Um, or yeah, it'll give the times, both times. And um, so you, people will be able to recognize it as soon as they walk out the door right there. In addition to that, um, I know we've had uh, tram tours in the past, and there's been times where we did, the guides did tram tours, some of the docents have helped tram tours, back and forth with that. We're doing a garden tram tour this year, and that is it. It will be the only tram tours that will be um, uh, given, and they will be at 2.30 on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, I have really pushed to try to set those times at 2.30 so that it would give you the ability to go to the one o'clock walking tour and possibly pick up the 2.30 tour for the tram tour and, and that would be your uh, volunteer section or volunteer time slot. The tram tours are different from what they are in the past. Um, I'm revamping the script for that. There's gonna be a lot that is uh, eliminated on that because we're not going to the orchard, the greenhouse lot. There's a lot of areas that are being taken out of that because I want this to be more of a garden tour. So you will be utilizing the tram, but you'll take the tram out. And for now, I'm going to gear a lot of it towards the garden for everyone because it's the most accessible and easiest for to people to get around. But if, um, during the season, you're the guide that day and you decide, you know what, the formal garden's incredible today or the Four Seasons garden. We have the tram driver stop, you actually get off the tour, you walk into the gardens and I wanna spend at least 20 minutes in one of the gardens uh, discussing what's blooming or something about the garden. There'll still be those aspects as you go around the property of historic nature that you can kinda talk about as you're going, riding on the tour. Um, the tour will end in front of Lily House. The, the tram will stop in front of Lily House, I should say. And then the, the, uh, the, to finalize it, you will take the group, walk them from the front of Lily House to the beer garden. And then they will have the opportunity to go in and get a drink or a, an item of food. That's part of, this is a ticketed tram, so they have to buy a ticket for it. Um, and they, they will have an opportunity to buy that. And they can stay there if they like, but at 3.30, the tram leaves to come back, and that's the end of your responsibilities as well to get them back over here. Um, and I will be giving specific tram tours on my April training dates. The first two training dates that are on, all the training dates are on the back of your itinerary today. So those April dates will be me um, I'm going to talk about the tram and we're going to take a tram tour. That day will probably be a little bit longer than some of the trainings normally just because there's so much to cover. So I will try to uh, do the tram but also show you some of the highlights. This year, we, I was debating on having a tour today. <laughs> and then as we got a little closer and a little closer, I'm like, no, nah, this is not going to work because it's, we're having a real spring. Uh, Everything's peaking up. There's a few things blooming, but next week it's going to explode. Um, the temperatures are going up. We're going to have moisture. Um, and I was just talking to Jamie this morning. She's going to give you a presentation on the details of spring plantings. But we have 30, over 30,000 annuals that are getting ready to get, into the, get put into the garden, placed along with the bulbs and the other bedding spaces. So a lot to see, a lot of color. It's gonna be pretty spectacular. Um, let's see, I kinda of went through all of that through memory, so I'm looking at my notes to make sure I didn't forget anything. Uh, there is one thing I will mention, um, bloom struck, which is you can uh, sponsor a container. So you, you'll see uh, there has been one sponsored in the Garden Guide's behalf. The uh, container right, um, this one's right by the steps at the front entrance here. So if you come up out of the steps of the garage, there's a container right there and it will say in recognition of the garden guides. Somebody anonymously gave this to you guys because you were awesome. So 
I will pass this on to Estelle, but um, that's something that's going throughout the property for both spring and summer. So you'll see that in the containers as well as, um, so a sponsorship with that. Um, the one other thing I wanted to mention is uh, Jonathan and I had a conversation uh, the other week and we want to offer the garden guides. We have a horticulture symposium every year in February that I really would love to see your guys' attendance at. So in order to do that, we're going to have the opportunity for you guys to come in at 50% off at half price. Um, it's really nice. Uh, uh, one caveat on this, certified guides, because that's the incentive to take that final tour with Oren or myself or somebody else <clears throat> and get certified. It's not that scary. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Oren's not a scary guy. Uh, <laughs> yes, he is. Does he frown when you miss a plant or something? Uh, we, <laughs> I, we were getting less people taking the test when I was doing the tour, so uh, I don't know why I'm so scary, but I can forget a name just like anybody else, even more so these days. Uh, but I hope that that gives you a little bit more incentive. It's a great symposium every year, really great information. Um, and fun day. It's an entire day, day-long symposium with lunch included. Um, so I encourage you to think about that for next uh, next February. We'll be doing another one. Um, I want to try to stay on schedule. I'll be giving some other announcements later on in the afternoon uh, at the end of this just to make sure everything gets covered. Are there any questions before uh, we bring in some of the speakers to talk? No? Excellent. Well, I'd like to introduce, uh, well, many of you know him, Jonathan Wright is our Deputy Director, Ruth Lilly Deputy Director of uh, Horticultural and Natural Resources. Uh, Jonathan's going to give you a broad overview of spring and then some of the things to come. So, thank you. I am not going to do I know. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. And... Uh, great to see all of you in here. Thank you for joining us on a cold, snowy morning. Uh, like Chad said, it's a real spring, which means gardeners get excited and then deflated and excited and deflated. So thank you all for joining us. Um, I just wanted to give you a, a quick overview of uh, our first season that we're going to launch into this year with all of your help. And you should start seeing billboards around town. You should start seeing ads through social media and on Facebook. You should hear us on the radio. Um, and we're growing off of the success of last year's campaign for spring blooms and really uh, trying to broaden the invitation. So part of our whole um, reasoning behind branding our entire campus and switching over to welcoming people to new fields, a place for nature and the arts, is that we're kind of convinced that this is a very special place. This is not like anywhere else in the state, and we actually don't think there are a lot of places like this anywhere in the country where we can combine art and nature and experiences in such an amazing way. And so we wanted the invitation for spring to be more than just come look at flowers. Last year it was, the message was a little bit like, we have a garden, we have a garden, we have a garden, come see a quarter of a million blooms. And this year, all of the imagery that you'll see is very floral centric. Um, and I think from hopefully we were taking a bet that for most people, spring means flowers. And when you invite people to come see spring, we want them to know that it's flowers, but it's more than just flowers here. And so you'll see um, some crazy billboards around town. There'll be some incredible social media ads that are targeted for the, what's happening that week, what's going on at that exact time. And so we've asked them to uh, really extend it and say, it's more than just tulips, it's more than just daffodils. Um, but what we'll, you'll see hopefully is the week when the daffodils are at peak, and Jamie's gonna talk to you a little bit about the phenology and how that will roll out. I, think a little bit, um, that there'll be updates going out, um, telling you what's happening each week. And our, our social media team and our marketing team is going to run ads that are appropriate. So when the daffodils are at peak, you're probably going to see an ad that has lots of daffodils in it that says, the daffodils are blooming now. And by now, we mean hurry. 
Um, and we're really going to try and create a sense of urgency around what's blooming each week to get people here to see them. Um, but we know that here at Newfields, it's more than it's. Um, we're the garden folks, so it's really about the garden to us. But there are also incredible things happening in the galleries. So. You'll see ads for art exhibitions that are opening inside. Um, this year we have two exciting openings during spring. One of them is a crazy um, hat exhibition called Best Ben, the Mad Hatter of Chicago. And for those of you who haven't heard of this exhibition, think crazy, many nature-inspired hats that are fanciful, that have like cabbages and butterflies and um, stuffed puppy dog um, uh, stuffed animals on them. They're these wild, fanciful hats. I heard someone describe it as it's what Lady Gaga would have worn if she was around in the 1940s. Um, we didn't have Lady Gaga then. We had Elizabeth Taylor and um, uh, Lucille Ball who were wearing these hats. So it's a really fun, fanciful fashion arts exhibition that's inside. Um, and then that's in April. And then in May, we have Collecting Contemporaries opening, which is the largest collection of works on paper ever gifted to the IMA. So this is works from the um, K. Cook and the Wolf families have donated to us. And they have, there's some really big name pieces in this collection. There are Warhol and a few other really big pieces. So that opens uh, in May. So as things are unfolding in the garden, things are unfolding in the galleries. And that's something that um, throughout any season when people are here, um, we are the experts in the garden and we really love and we are so grateful to have all of you help us host our guests when they're here. Um, that's something that we're really big on and um, I don't have to tell all of you that. You do that every time you give a tour which is you make our guests feel spe special and welcome and they're getting a really unique experience when they're here and they're out on a tour with us. And that's the time that that's the time that they're spending with us, but it's also as Chad said, you know, paying attention and sort of feeling out who your guests are, who the people are on your tours or that you encounter when you're out on your tour. And if they take an interest in something, and Oren's going to lead an amazing tour later, I'm sorry I can't join you for that later, but I'm going to join your next one that you give. Um, so if there are connections that you can make to things inside, you know, encourage them to um, either you know, come inside and see something in the gallery, or if they liked some of the native wildflowers, encourage them to head down to the park and really let them know about all that we have to offer. Uh, Chad mentioned the evening hours. Where I'm very, this is something I'm very excited about. Rather than just saying we're open late during spring, well, we've actually shifted that our hours are going to be seasonal moving forward. So from April through October, we're going to be open late on Friday, Saturday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday evenings. Uh, so what we're doing is we've shaved an hour off of Thursday nights. And for those of you who have come on Thursday nights, there's usually about four people here between... Uh, 8 and 9 p.m. And so despite everyone saying, we love that it's open so late, we love that it's open so late, all of our data show that people come from 6 to 8 and then they head home. And so why not shave that hour off, let our staff go home a little earlier, and then add that hour on a night when people will actually come and use it. So we're really excited. Um, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but by making this shift in hours, we're open a total, it's, it's weeks of extra hours open for the public because of this shift. So um, I'm really hoping that that being accessible and open to people will be um, a plus. This is the one ad that I, I love. So you'll see this with a lot of different flowers. We've highlighted um, daffodils and tulips and poppies and all sorts of things um, with these ads that will be um, very well, hopefully very well timed. Um, Jamie and I are optimistic about that. Um, so a quick overview of spring uh, and a note for all of you that I think another thing that I think is exciting, rather than the garden just being this little tear off sheet of paper that given it gets given to our guests with their uh, museum map, we're really trying to embrace the idea once and for all, yay, we're getting there, that this is an amazing, extraordinary place that has a lot to offer. And you're no longer gonna get a museum map or a garden map or a park map, you get one map booklet that has everything you want in it with tabs. And so the first page when you open will have our seasonal sort of highlights. So the first page this year is going to say, hello, spring, and it'll tell you everything that's happening inside and out, sort of in a big picture. And then you can go through floors of the galleries. It'll highlight works of art or shows that are opening. And when you get to the garden or the park, it'll highlight what's going on in the garden. So I'm very excited about this. So a big, big level picture for this, it'll just tell you sort of what's going on, that there's something happening in the greenhouse, that there is a beer garden out there if you want something to eat or drink or a snack. Um, uh, in this case, this spring, we have Inspired by Spring, which is an exhibition of photographs taken last spring throughout the garden by our staff and a longtime volunteer. Um, so that's 
um, harkening back to last spring, and that's the whole second floor of Lily is open, uh, or a couple of the galleries on the second floor of Lily. So people can stroll up, see the images of last spring, and look out the windows and enjoy seeing out to this year. And then featured flowers. This is, if anybody has a better way of calling this out for next year, please help us, because I struggled over that. But what we wanted to do was, we knew we couldn't call out every single place in the garden that has something amazing happening, but we wanted to sort of do those icons of, if you're new here or you haven't been back in a while, what are the places we should wander through the garden to hit? So we, these icons show all of the places that those 30,000 annuals, 30,000 plus annuals, and 130,000 bulbs that our team planted in the fall. Um, I think they're led by a crazy person. Um, but uh, these are the like, sort of the main areas that we don't want people to miss. And last year, we really encouraged people during spring, we really had a prescribed path. We actually put signs out that said, go this way, go this way, go this way. Our feedback showed that people loved taking the sort of off the beaten track, but they didn't necessarily follow that path. So we will probably very much have, we will have people out to guide uh, and uh, greet you and sort of say, oh, if you haven't been in a while, we suggest you take this path, but we're not going to map a route that you have to take. And we hope that people will wander and explore. And as you all are really good at telling them, please walk on the grass. Um, this is one of those crazy over the top hats from Best Ben, just to show you what's going on inside. Now, this isn't, this is a different kind of nature. Um, and if people want to enjoy bringing their dogs here, we welcome them to bring their dogs to the park. But what I love is that if you notice, even the dog is wearing a hat in the crazy hat and it's filled with flowers and grasses and plants. So a lot of these hats have a nature theme. I'm, I haven't seen them all firsthand yet, but I'm really excited about that. Um, this is a, a famous photo photograph from the K. Cook and Walter Wolf exhibition that we're very excited about. Um, it's uh, a great show. And then later in the season, I think you've all seen the blue snail in, the, in Ephraimson. Since this isn't just about spring today, I wanted to give you a little heads up about what else is going on. Um, later this year, we have an invasion happening. So we have hundreds of sculptures that are made out of recycled plastic, like the blue snail in the, in the, in the lobby, uh, in the Ephraimson Entry Pavilion. They're all vivid, bright colors, and they, they are a purposefully disarming uh, piece of work by an artist group out of Italy called the Cracking Art Group. Cracking is actually the process of when you break down um, material to make plastic. It's a part of the scientific process or the, uh, the production process. They want to draw attention in a fun and disarming way to a lot of issues that are very pressing about our, our use as humans of natural resources, um, the prolif pro proliferation of plastics, um, what invasives, what we've done to the planet with using all this plastic and um, invasive species and how sort of the balance is sometimes out of control. So they build these oversized animals and they drop them in places where the public are and they play with that balance and they want people to think about it. So they've got some really great messages behind each of the pieces that they've created. And for the first time ever, we're going to have an exhibition that is in the galleries and in, out in the, our outdoor galleries in the garden. And so you will see hundreds of these animals everywhere. So we've got the big blue snail in the foyer. His friends are on their way. They're just really, really slow. Um, there will be dozens more of different sizes that will be climbing the glass, the walls, the columns, all around the Ephraimson Entry Pavilion, inside and out. When you go up the escalators into the gallery, they're gonna be, it's gonna be a giant, you're gonna be like inside an aquarium with dozens and dozens of giant colorful fish hanging from the ceiling. When you go into the Pulliam Great Hall, you're going to be stared at by a, um, oh, I just, it went right out of my head. What do you call a, on land, penguins have a different name in a herd or in a group on land, anybody know? Anyway, in water they have one name and in land, on land they have another. But you'll be stared at by a group of penguins from the gallery balconies looking down at you. Um, and then as you go out into the garden, you'll follow a snail or two out and there'll be a big giant spiral of snails on the tennis court lawn. Uh, a group of meerkats will be um, staring at you from behind the hedges and above the arbors in the formal garden. Uh, I'm sure the brides are going to love me. Um, there will be wolves standing sentry in a boulevard down the middle of the LA, giant elephant holding up the house below Lily, um, bears picking orch apples in the orchard, um, 
giant floating frogs in the fountain at the far end of the LA, uh, a flock of birds in the beer garden. They're everywhere. And the idea is that we want you to get out and explore the garden. And this is a very disarming way to talk about something quite serious. So we're really excited about it. This group of artists, it's the first time they've done anything in museums in the US, but they've done some pretty impressive work uh, internationally at Art Basel and something. So um, Charles is still convinced that people are going to yell at him and say it's not art, but um, he's, he's willing to take it. Um, this is just one of the sketches to give you an idea that there are a lot of them on their way, and uh, it should be really fun and very playful. So the, t the theme of this summer is um, that we're using the title of the exhibition, which is Summer Wonderland Spectacular Creatures. And we want people to come and enjoy Summer Wonderland here, which rolls out with everything that we're doing in the, with our fabulous garden, um, with our seasonal plantings, and then through other programming throughout the summer. Um, <laughs> this is the bears in the orchard. Uh, giant swallows at the beer garden entrance. Although I'm going to try and convince the artist to move these, Sue and Marion are on board, into the atrium of the greenhouse so that when you go inside, they're, they're out of scale and kind of fun and playful. Um, because we already have, I don't know if you can see here, but this is a flock of birds hanging from the pergola. Um, so that should be very fun this summer. Um, but leading up to summer, I just wanted to give you the quick behind the scenes. You all have, you get great updates um, with the gardeners uh, and your garden guide updates. But I just wanted to sort of do the big picture of spring. Uh, Jamie's going to give you a lot more detail about plants that you'll see throughout the year. Um, this is Patty Schneider's design for the 38th and Michigan Road corner. Um, you may notice that there's not a lot out there at the moment. If you've come in that way, there are some really ugly little flags sticking up through the snow this morning. We have a, a beautiful new sign coming that's going to spell out new fields across the corner, and it's going to have lighting and everything in it that'll be hopefully draw a little attention to our site, because I know a lot of people drive by and say, what's back there? Um, and Patty's trying to fight that with flowers, which is great. So bright, vivid, saturated colors. Uh, and again, you all know this, but the, the, the theme of the spring is really that we want a continual display of color and bloom. So Patty's planted early, mid, and late season tulips with some early dafts and then some later bulbs with the camassi and the allium so that we should have color there for a long period of the spring. Uh, Patty's a master with color, as you know. Our lead master of color, Irvin Etienne, this is his design for Noni's garden. So uh, Noni Krauss was known to be um, cheery and bright and very warm and welcoming person. So uh, Irvin always does bright and cheery colors there to kind of bring that mood and that tone uh, and greet our guests that way. And this, I think, is just uh, fantastic. I mean, it's, you can't, it's hard to go wrong with blue and yellow. Um, but really typical of Irvin, he picked some very strong, solid colors that are very vivid and very saturated. Um, and again, from early, early season with um, the hyacinths, uh, right on through the daffodils, and then uh, multiple tulips that you have that progression of bloom. But what you're going to start to see a hint of here is what our team is our masters at, which is creating rich combinations that bloom in succession so that you won't ever find a time when all of this is blooming at once. You all know that. You're, you're, you're gardeners. But, um, but what you will have is this beautiful color palette will extend over the whole season. And things like nemesias and wait till you see. I've just heard that the uh, Iceland poppies are be were beautifully grown for us and they look amazing this year. So they're already blooming, apparently. I didn't think they'd be blooming until the into May, um, but that's because I always started with really little plants. Irvin's like, oh, go big. So he's buying big, fully grown plants that these will be gorgeous. So you'll have a lot of cool season annuals that Jamie's going to go through, like the ranunculus and the um, nemesias, uh, but then a lot of ornamental edibles, so kales and, and mustard greens and other edibles um, to really bring some richness of text, foliage texture into the combinations. Just so, because uh, Irvin, I think, likes to mess with me, I um, would not have guessed this as Irvin's design because I think of him usually as really strong, rich, saturated colors. And here, um, this is his uh, combination for the Sutphin fountain beds. And so uh, I'm guessing, uh, knowing Irvin, that he probably started with one of these 
plants and then started playing off of all the colors because I think this sort of beautiful muted, um, these pastel peaches. Uh, and then, you know, to give it a little urban kick, he's got the black and the dark purple in there to really punch it up. Um, again, uh, Nemesias, if you haven't seen them or grown them, we used a number of them last year. They were quite beautiful. Uh, they come in a wide range of colors. Some of the flowers are quite small and in clusters and some of the flowers are a little larger. Um, Jamie, we'll go through it with you, but everything, of course, will be labeled, so you'll be able to find the exact name of all these varieties of uh, things like the wallflowers, which are wonderful and incredibly fragrant. So these rich combinations will really um, assure, because they've thought everything through, that you'll have, we'll have color on the very beginning of spring right through into early summer. Uh, I believe these are the bridge pots. Um, is that right, Jamie? I think these are the bridge pots, um, or maybe along the drive, garden entry pots. Um, and I just put this in here again because I loved the fact that it's a really beautiful, moody color combinations. And this is something that our team does really, really well. They spend a lot of time thinking through the combinations in a very painterly way so that we can bring um, sort of that artistry to our plant combinations. Um, we like to say, it, the public probably wouldn't get it, but we like to say that we're really curating a, a, a garden experience the way we curate things in the galleries. Um, this is Patty Schneider's. Again, Patty's a master of color, but also of texture. This is her Three Graces bed combination. And what I love is that she is never, um, all of our team is like this, but Patty in particular, never finishes a, a bed. So if it's in full bloom and everyone's jaws are dropping, she's standing back going, now if I had changed that, this would punch up better. So last year she noticed how much the yellow showed up from the, at the Three Graces bed, which is, for those of you who are not as familiar with the names, that's the new big arced bed at the far end of the LA between the big fountain and the sculpture of the Three Graces um, and the hedge at the end of the LA. From a distance, so if you're looking from the house, you want that bed to pop and really see it. And she had a lot of dark purples and burgundies in there last year with the yellow. And she read that, it was gorgeous when you walked by it, but she told me that it all disappeared from a distance. So this year she's flipped and she's gone silvery, silvery foliage with white and yellow so that it will all glow from a distance. But then she couldn't help herself, so she added this burgundy, lacy, um, mustard green, um, so that when you walk up close, you'll have a little bit of that depth of color to it. And, um, and you know, nothing is an accident, so this is a very fringy thing. And then you got the fringed tulip there as well. So again, every detail is obsessed over, so feel free to point those out to our guests. Um, and then this is, I believe this is the front of Lily. And this is also Patty Schneider. Last year she did that incredible moody, purples and blues and burgundies um, with little little hits of orange across the front of Lily, which was incredible. Um, and the big one of the big players in that was these incredible Persian fritillaries. If you didn't get a chance to see them last year, look for them again in front of Lily House this year. They're quite beautiful, silvery, very delicate foliage. And then these flowers that almost look like dusky clusters of grapes or they're sort of that like purple black. Really beautiful. That was in that bed. She's hoping they'll be back. So will the allium. So she decided to change and rather than going all silvers, purples with a hint of orange, she's going soft pinks. And my guess again is that she thinks that these colors, because they're light and bright, will show up from the far end of the LA so that no matter where you are in the garden, that this garden shows up well. A lot of wonderful fragrance from some of the things that she's chosen too with the stock on the far right. Um, this is the Lily House containers, I believe. So the back terrace at Lily. Um, and again, just not to go, uh, to, not to belabor this too much, but she, it, our team put so much thought into this. So these are containers that are quite tall. So you get to see things up close and at eye level. So she's gone with a lot of variegated foliage, which I think um, up close is gonna add a lot of um, interest because you can see them. You don't have to bend down to the ground to see all of the detail here. And again, it's Patty, so the texture with the, is that um, black lace symbucus? Oh. oh, it's a very close up picture of fennel. Uh, so bronze fennel, again, edible um, or, or herbs with great color. Thank you. So this was the one that I was confused by the other day because I couldn't remember exactly where it was. You can tell I don't get my hands dirty enough anymore. Um, 
And our team is so talented that I don't often see these until they're done, which is amazing. So this is the bed that goes across the entire front of the greenhouse, um, uh, where the fence, is, part of the fence is, and the fence used to be in front of the greenhouse. And so this is also Patty's design. And in, because it was, there was a vegetable garden there and a cut flower uh, garden, she's gone heavily, heavy with um, not only bulb color, but cabbages and per, uh, purple bok, cho uh, bok choy and beautiful um, greens with that rich color and great texture that will pop against the flower colors that she's chosen with the daffodils and the tulips. Um, the great euphorbia and um, so that perennial uh, bleeding heart with the golden foliage, which is really stunning. And then uh, Gwen Rager uh, did a combination for the pop-up garden. So what was known as Alice's Garden this year will be back, or last year, will be back this year um, as a pop-up garden. And um, we are, she, you know, we don't like to ever repeat the same thing again and again and again. Even when something is wonderful, we think, well, what can we do that's different? And so that garden last year, I think many of you saw how stunning it was with the um, French blend rose tulips, which were all these like beautiful pastels. And do you remember the wire birds that Gwen made that were by the nest? Well, they have gotten, um, they've shed their plumage and they've, um, they have new plumage this year and they're based on fiery rich reds and oranges and fiery colors, um, which are reflected in the plantings here that Gwen chose. So uh, big beds of lupins that she's experimenting with to see because um, sometimes an old plant or an old fashioned plant that nobody grows anymore is fun to see what, what we can do with it. Um, and so lupins are one of those sort of old classic garden plants that has fallen out of favor in some ways. And I, I think they're fantastic. So I'm thrilled that she's experimenting with those. And then using the colors from the lupins to really give you that fiery palette. And then that little hit of the dark tulip just to punch it up. I'm, I'm quizzing Jamie. <laughs> so another combination that our team put together just to give you... Thank you. So Patty's uh, border garden, and, uh, and which makes perfect sense because a lot of this is more perennial bulb. So um, with the anemones and this wonderful little allium uh, and the muscari, um, this will be, uh, again, a progression of bloom, but these are bulbs that will perennialize and come back year after year after year. So uh, big, one of the big questions that I keep getting is, well, you planted 150,000 bulbs last year. Um, what happened to all of those? And the answer is most of them stayed in the ground. We pulled out around 60,000 annual bulbs that were put in very sort of pockets of color, but that means 90,000 bulbs were permanent and stayed in the ground. We added 130,000 new bulbs this year. Um, more of them are perennial than last year. So every year we're ratcheting up the number of bulbs that will stay permanently in the garden and hopefully will be here for years to come. So I'm thinking next year, what, half a million blooms? Um, so I'll uh, turn it back over to Chad at that point, and I'll be around for a little bit if anybody has questions. Thank you, Jonathan. Appreciate it. Uh, any questions to that point? I know there's a lot he covered. Um, I just want to introduce uh, our next speaker, Chandler Bryant, who many of you know. He is the manager of the Art and Nature Park. He's going to talk a little bit, give some updates on uh, what's going on in the park. All right, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? <clears throat> uh, so yeah, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to talk to you all today. Um, just to talk, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the upcoming things, some of the things that we're doing in the park and uh, some of the things that you can talk about with our, our guests on, uh, on tours or any other time. <clears throat> so because we're talking about spring um, right now, I wanted to just focus uh, on the spring uh, wildflower locations in the park. So some of the places that you can, uh, that you can see all the different uh, native spring ephemerals that we have in the park. Some of the plantings are more natural plantings, uh, you know, stuff that's come up after we've released it from uh, invasive plants. So areas like this is um, natural. This is more natural. Here we've got some uh, natural uh, wildflower locations. And then, and then around the visitor's pavilion, there were some... May apples and things like that there to begin with, but we're really uh, blowing it up. And we, the last two years, we've planted uh, about a little over a thousand uh, native spring ephemerals, uh, several different species, mostly um, trilliums, uh, bluebells, 
some blood roots, uh, that, that type of thing. So uh, yeah, I just want to show a couple pictures. So this is what we this is what we run into. Of course, everybody knows how uh, disturbed the park was, um, and what some of the areas look like that we haven't been able to get cleaned out. So this is just a a horrible picture, really, of the uh, the invasion that's going on in some of our in some of our areas. Uh, this was taken in 2016. A few days after this, we had a Lily volunteer group come through and clear all the, all, oh, sorry, all the honeysuckle. And then we actually treated the Euonymus uh, in late fall. So once we release these areas from all this invasion, um, this is kind of what we're shooting for. So we want, we want to release and open up the understory so that some of the, some of the, um, uh, Flowers that have been dormant for so many years underneath all this um, invasion uh, can be released and kind of come up. So you have some false rue anemone here, uh, big pockets, some cut leaf toothwort here, uh, some Dutchman's breeches. Uh, there's some trilliums, Cecily in here from uh, place in place. And, and what you can see and what I really like about this site, this is, uh, so I can go back. This is actually right here where that picture was taken. So that every spring, that area comes up by itself. We've, we haven't done any actual uh, spring ephemeral plantings in there. That's all just stuff that once we released the, um, once we got rid of all the invasives and things, that's, that's kind of what came up. So uh, yeah, so what, what, what I really enjoy about this section is you can start to see some of the, even the understory woodies coming back, um, the Buckeyes and things like that, that are starting to germinate and pop through. and. And so we have a really, really nice, diverse overstory, um, a, a native mid, a mid understory, and then of course the nice, real nice uh, native wildflowers. Uh, so that's bloodroot. Uh, we have bloodroot all throughout the park. Uh, I, I was joking earlier that this picture has some really good plants and then some really bad plants. So I needed to frame this in a little tighter, obviously. Um, but yeah, it's garlic mustard, ranunculus, and then a really nice patch of blood root. That's uh, all um, uh, just been here. It's not been planted. And then Virginia bluebells. So uh, Virginia bluebells seems to be one of the easier native spring ephemerals to get on the um, uh, through nurseries and things like that, just because uh, it's easily divided. But so that's one of the ones that we've really been pushing, especially around the visitors' pavilion, just because it is easier to get. Um, and so we're we're expecting really nice carpets of oops, of Virginia bluebell all along this uh, or around the visitors' pavilion this year, all, along with other native spring ephemerals, but especially uh, Virginia bluebells. Uh, so yeah, that's that's about it for our spring locations. Um, there's like I mentioned uh, earlier, you know, there's kind of uh, different places all throughout, but uh, those are really the focus areas. So and uh, some of the other updates, uh, what stuff that we're doing out in the park, uh, we're really pushing natural play areas. So. We want kids to get out and enjoy and use natural materials and play, so imaginative play with those natural materials. So what we've done, and Patty started this when, when she was um, over the park, is putting in these play patches using all kinds of different materials that you would find out in nature. So we have a play patch here, some of you are aware, it's a wood play patch. It's in the shape, uh, shape of a tulip poplar leaf. The, the play patch itself, and then it, everything that's in there is made of wood. So there's wood uh, seats, uh, wood, wood sticks, whatever the case may be, but people just use this and they build things and, and kids just really enjoy using this, this little play patch here. And then I think it was two years ago we put in this play patch up back behind the visitor's pavilion. That is our rock or sand play patch. It's basically a big sand pit back here. Uh, and it's got big giant boulders in it to uh, let kids play and, and jump from the rocks and things like that. And then lastly, one of the things that, um, that we're really proud of this past year is this last play patch, which is the grass labyrinth. Some of you have seen it. I have a picture of it here in a minute, but 
Um, it's just a third of the natural materials, and uh, we're really looking forward to how well it will grow in this year. Um, it's so. This will be the third growing season for the labyrinth. The labyrinth is made out of um, uh, switchgrass, panicum brigatum, and then a little blue stem. I won't even say the, the scientific on little blue stem. Uh, but um, yeah, so uh, here's a picture of the play pad, or of the grass labyrinth. It's 115, 120 feet in diameter. So it's a pretty large um, area, and it's about 1,200 individual plants. Uh, this was it, like in the super early spring last year. So I expect it to really uh, fill in this year, and all these beds will be really nice and dense. So uh, we'll have nice borders. So yeah, the, the play patches is, is something we're really uh, excited about and we're gonna investigate ways to uh, make more play patches and more natural materials. So if anybody has any ideas, natural materials, things like that, I'm, I'm all ears. <clears throat> okay, another thing that we're really trying to push in the park is all the wildlife viewing opportunities. So we want our guests to be able to come and engage with the wildlife. So not necessarily be real close to them, but just understand what it is that they're looking at, what it is that they're watching, what it is that they're seeing, and uh, try to educate as much as possible. So like here at the viewing stations uh, near Stratum Pier, we have viewing stations. They're similar to... Um, ones that you might see at a national park or something like that. They're free, of course. And they overlook artificial basking structure that we've put in the lake. So by artificial basking structure, I mean logs that we've uh, pushed out into the lake and sort of tethered to the bottom of the lake that just float along. They rise when the lake rises and they fall when the lake falls. But within three days of putting those logs in this area, they were completely lined with turtles. So from this viewing station here, you, you have a really good opportunity to view the turtles. And then there's identification signage at the, this location so that you can, when, when people are looking through the viewing stations, they can learn what it is that they're looking at. Uh, another area that we're really trying to increase engagement is the visitor's pavilion. So like I mentioned earlier, we have those native spring ephemeral plantings all around the visitor's pavilion, but also we've put in bird feeding station at the visitor's pavilion. So it's basically just a, a really nice bird, bird feeding station with six different types of feeders, four different types of food for the birds. Um, and it's also uh, caught on live stream uh, on, a, on our website. So uh, I have the link later on, but you can get on the Newfields website and actually watch these bird feeders, uh, listen to the to the stream in the back in the background of your computer. I do that sometimes just to hear the birds. Uh, it's it's really nice. And so what we're trying to do is get people to actually stay and enjoy the visitors pavilion. So actually hang out there, and 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 learn learn from some of the educational materials that we have in the visitors pavilion, but also just to, and to watch the birds and things. And then just some of these other circles are just really good spots to, um, to just view wildlife. Uh, of course, always over the lake, you're going to see, right now, we're actually seeing a lot of migrants. So we had loons on the lake earlier this week, which, as you guys probably know, that's not very common unless they're migrating through and we just got lucky and we're out there at the same time. But also, uh, we've been seeing a lot of eagles uh, herons are out there every day. A lot of different species of ducks, um, but we're just we're we really enjoy being able to uh, see what comes into the lake, especially this time of year. So there's uh, a pileated woodpecker at our bird feeding station at the visitors pavilion. Just going to town. There's a stack of turtles. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, the, it looks like those are common map turtles. It's hard to tell. They're really dry, and they're, if, it, if they were red-eared sliders, there would be a red ear here, but when they get real dry, sometimes it's hard to tell, but they do look like map turtles. Okay, so um, last, last couple things I wanted to mention. Uh, right now, and for the foreseeable future, we have a plat path closure in the park. So we've actually installed chain-link fencing, 
on each side of this closure through here. Uh, some of you may know and others of you may not, but what's happening here is we have an erosion issue where the river, uh, when it rises, it comes up and it actually wants to undercut this bank. This bank uh, is basically a high portion of overburden where when they were quarrying this site, they pushed overburden up on top of this berm so that they could keep the river at bay. Well, the river, the river wants to access this floodplain easier, and so what it wants to do is kind of undercut this uh, embankment here and uh, have easier access to just flow in. So we're working on solutions for shoring that up. We're working on solutions on how do, how do, we, how do we get the path open. So we, we have um, an engineering firm that we're working with right now, Christopher Burke Engineering, to try and identify those solutions. Uh, we'll know more here uh, in the near future, but for, for at least for the foreseeable future, the path will be closed around the lake and there will be no complete access. What I do want to mention, though, is... <clears throat> We still encourage our guests to go back behind the lake, but they won't be able to make it all the way through. So some of you know, some of you don't, there is a path that runs back here and then it splits. And then, I'm sorry that it cut it off here. I'm really sorry about that. But uh, the path splits and it allows guests to kind of walk up and around and then come back. Um, so it's, it's sort of a loop. It's not what our guests are gonna want, I can tell you that, but... Uh, it is, it is an opportunity to get back there and see some of the really nice big trees that are back in there. There's a really, really, really fabulous Osage orange about right here. It's the only one on the property. It's large, and it does drop the Osage orange um, fruit. Um, so, yeah, uh, like I said, uh, we just want to encourage people to, to stay away from this area as much as possible. We have a lot more signage now. We, have, we do have some signage that talks about the issue on either side so that people are educated about what it is that's happening. <clears throat> Any questions about the path? Yeah. This is about the parking lot. Is it open? Ah, good question. Yes, I was just about to bring that up. Uh, so the parking lot is not open yet, but Citizens is working on building us a turnaround so that uh, we can have our guests enter the Art and Nature Park parking lot and then when they leave, go under 38th Street and then there's a new turnaround that they're putting in that allows you to immediately turn back up and take the ramp back up to 38th Street. Uh, that ramp is hopefully going to be open by April 1st. That's, that's kind of the deadline that we had hoped that citizens might accomplish. Sounds like they're on track for that, but um, we can't be for sure. Yeah. That is correct, yes. So, <clears throat> um, they, um, unfortunately we don't have the museum map, but people are allowed to park in the pump house parking lots and then walk past the garden terrace shack where that uh, security member will give them a sticker for the Fairbanks Park and then they're allowed to walk down the service drive and cross over into the, into the park. So we're not actually forcing people to walk through the museum now, although they certainly still can uh, walk through the museum and then out. Um, a, a lot of the reason that we're doing this pump house parking and then walk down is for dog walkers and things like that that want to be able to access the park. <clears throat> Okay, so yeah, I, I wanted to bring that um, clo road closure up. Uh, I'm hopeful that we'll have it open by April 1st when the park officially opens. We'll just have to see. So some things to watch for in 2018. In fall 2017, so last fall, we, um, thanks to, um, oh my gosh, the name is losing, I lost the name, but thanks to a generous donor, uh, we have the pollinator garden, Oh, sorry. Uh, but thanks to a Jennifer, generous donor, uh, we uh, got the money to put in a pollinator garden. It's directly across from Funky Bones. So if you were standing in the road and Funky Bones was on your left, the pollinator garden is right there on your right. It's, it's about a 3,000, 20, 2,800 square foot area with 3,000 individual plants, 25 different species, all selected for their pollinator qualities, and then also selected to uh, 
increase the overall bloom time. So we're getting bloom from, you know, early to mid summer throughout the fall. Uh, um, yeah, like I mentioned earlier, the larger and more diverse native spring ephemeral plantings around the visitor's pavilion. Something else that we're really excited about this summer is a floating habitat island. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever seen one, and I sh should have added a picture after this so that you could see what I'm talking about. But basically, it's uh, an island that has soil and everything on it and a whole bunch of plants, and we just float it out into the lake and then tether it to the ground, similar to our artificial basking structures. So <clears throat> there'll be uh, a lot of pollinator species on there, uh, so like cardinal flower, um, black-eyed Susan, echinacea, some of the, some of the common ones. Um, and so I had talked earlier about how we wanted to continue to increase engagement and interpretation in the park. So we just want, since, since there's not as much programming going on in the park right now, uh, and there's just, there's not anybody out there to interpret every day, what we want to do is find ways to engage and interpret with our guests with nobody around. So a lot of times that's signage. Uh, but other other times it's just opening vistas and views so that you get people to actually go into certain places in the park or explore certain areas. So we're really working hard on figuring out how we how we engage without an actual presence. Um, and then I mentioned the live stream of the bird feeders. Uh, this summer there will be a stream of a uh, inside of a birdhouse as well. It's just a house, a birdhouse that we have near the visitor's pavilion. We had it last year, and it had a house wren in it. It had two successful nests. Um, <clears throat> we're hoping for something like a chickadee or something cool, but house wrens are fine, too. Uh, and then the nesting platform, which still has nothing on it. Um, the platform itself uh, hasn't had much activity, but we're hopeful with all the sightings of eagles and um, ospreys and even some of the owl species that may or may not use that platform. Um, we're hopeful that maybe one of these days we'll, we'll get um, somebody home. And then what I'm really excited about and what some of uh, the park garden guides had asked for is <clears throat> to do spring tours of the park so that I can go out with you guys and we can talk about what spring ephemerals that we're seeing and um, just talk about what's going to be happening in the park for that summer. So I have the two dates. I think Chad had uh, on your schedule or whatever, he has the dates for our walkthroughs. But May 1st at 1, May 3rd at 5.30. Even if you're not a park guide and you just want to check out the park, come and we'll walk and we'll hang out and we'll have a good time and we'll go around and we'll look at all the plants and, and see everything that's blooming. It's a really good time of the year for the park, so it should be a good time. Any questions about the park? Yeah. Do you mean like um, the, our tree, our native tree walk? Uh, yeah, just uh, uh, identifiers. Mm. Well, no, not necessarily. Uh, there is a native tree walk. Did, are you aware of that? Uh, so um, there is a native tree walk. So if you go down to the park and grab a park map, it has a, a, a 33 species of trees, and you can go and visit all of the 33 of those species uh, so you can find them all on the map. So that's all we have as far as identification of things right now. I would love to have more in the future. Um, and I think as we continue to add more woodies and things like that, we probably can, can do that. Yeah, right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That it's paid and everything. Closed, yeah. yeah. Right? Well, yeah, I believe so. There is going to be some uh, signage and even maybe even like a, a folding sign directly in the middle of the bridge. We're going to have to do some things that are like super obvious because people will just walk right past a lot of signs. So we're going to do our best to identify that. But yes, yes, that is in the plan. Yeah. I know. Yes. Yes, I, I'm super excited how much kids love it because I, I knew it would be a good contemplation space, but I didn't know how much kids would enjoy it. And you're right, it's, it's been amazing. It's been great. Yeah. Um, 
the, with the circles? Well, this PowerPoint is probably. Uh, and I'm, ha I'm absolutely happy to share it, like seriously. So, uh, so Jamie said we were going to put it online. And I believe this whole talk is uh, online too, right? It's going to be online. So that might help you a little bit, but... Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, please, if, if anybody has any questions, you all can jot down my email. It's cbryant at discovernewfields.org. If there's ever any questions about the park, feel free. Seriously. Anything else? Anybody? All right. Well, thank you guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Chandler. Uh, one, a couple things that he reminded me of that I wanted to mention. Um, he has updated the 100 Acres Manual, um, as well as several of the garden guides, Estelle and Darlene and Greg and Jamie, worked a great deal on updating the garden manual. So take a look at those. Uh, if you see Still, I think was going to start giving treats out for uh, any typos that we missed or anything else so we can try to update things. Um, the one thing that we are working on, I mentioned a tour sign for the garden. We're also going to have a tour sign for the park at the Lake Terrace so it describes every week or every uh, twice a month where they have tours on the first and third Saturdays of the month. Um, one thing that I mentioned before I bring uh, Oren up, we're running a little behind, but I want to try to get Orrin's in, um, is that the park will close. They, they're actually having a gate on that bridge now. So if you have guests with you that might be touring on uh, your tram tour or anything else, that when the museum hours are closing, that gate will close. I don't want them to get stuck in the park. So they need to get back across before the museum hours are closing. I don't know if that makes sense. Okay. Um, um, Oren? Yes. Oh. <laughs> He's here. Oren Cooley is going to give us a, uh, um, a, an idea of how well the art in the galleries blends with the, uh, the nature outside in the park in the gardens. Um, Oren Cooley. This is the events. That was the okay. okay. Good morning, and uh, welcome to our new year of great garden tours. Um, on the itinerary, it says that I'm to talk a little bit about the training process. Uh, if you're new to our program or thinking about becoming new to our program, the training in some ways is very simple. Uh, you come to our meetings, you indicate which of the tours, either the Art and Nature Park or the grounds, that you would like to give the tours. Uh, you start studying those materials. Uh, you shadow three times. You can shadow as much as you want, but at least three times. And then you come take a test with Chatter High. So uh, really, the test is not scary. <laughs> I know I've heard differently this morning, but I try to be very friendly. Um, but I do know where you all live. so just just in case <laughs> something's not right. Um, I always like to say uh, with tours, it's really a conversation with a group of people about something you're both very passionate about. It's not the scholarly lecture. It's not uh, a lot of historical data, although those things are important. It's really about engaging the person about these marvelous things that we have here, especially our plant resources. And uh, one of the delights of being the person who helps train is I get to see all the marvelous ways you tell our story, because there's not just one right answer. There are several. And, uh, you know, you're good with people, you're very flexible, uh, and you're great lifelong learners, all of which are key components of being a great garden guide. And, you know, the other data, the data with plants and the history and our goals, we can train you on that. But those first three things are very, very important. Um, not everyone passes. We've had a couple of people who did not make it through the years. I had one person uh, who could not identify shrubs very well, uh, took the test several times, identified uh, spirea as viburnums, identified fringe trees as viburnums. I didn't invite lilacs as viburnums. <laughs> Never, I didn't invite the, the viburnum as the viburnum. So, every once in a while, uh, that person now helps with the volunteer desk. Perfectly fine way of supporting our gardens, too. We need direction of all people, and people answer questions. Uh, but most people do extremely well. 
Well, one of my uh, big speech here today is talk about the connections between the art and our nature here on the grounds. And um, it all began with the ORCID program a year ago. Uh, I was asked to put together a, a tour about ORCIDs and artists, and I did. And the horticulturists loved it very much and asked me to do more of it this year and expand it, and the art dose has gotten involved. And they said, well, can you just put a tour together with some flowers and sort of make some connections? Well, when I started studying it, we have lots of connections. And um, at some point when you do research, you, know, you have to stop. So for this particular project, I was able to find one, over 100 direct connections between our property and the artwork in the gallery. Now, the museum has well over 50,000 pieces of art, uh, all of which are not on display at the same time. So things rotate through. So the pieces you're going to see are selected because they're on display currently. And uh, hopefully will be on display throughout most of Hello Spring. Uh, I was pleased that Every one of our gardens that we have have connections to art pieces in the galleries. Every one of our floors or galleries have connection to the art pieces in the Asian and the African collection. So um, here we go with a little sample. Uh, in the American Gallery, uh, we have William Forsythe, and here you can see his crocuses. And uh, one of the delightful things about this particular host spring tours, we're engaging both the art docents and the garden guides uh, to help uh, cross-pollinate, if you were, our collection for our, our particular visitors who come through. Uh, the tours themselves will be a Tuesday through Friday at 2 o'clock. They'll be short 30 minutes tours, which allow the, garden, the art docents to pick and choose what they want to talk about. And then on Saturday, the tour is at 12.30, so at 1 o'clock, they bring that group down to where you're going to start your garden, your garden tours. So here you can see William Forsyth's uh, crocuses. He was an Indiana artist. He himself was an avid, both he and his wife were avid gardeners. And so this is pretty much a view out his study window into his garden. And you see the early spring flowers there with the crocuses. Uh, you can use this, the art docents can use this as a way of talking about trilliums or any of our spring blooms. It's not designed to, to control tightly the information being said to show all the different combinations. And if American art is not your thing, the, your, the art docent can go into the design gallery, as you can see, this uh, chocolate set, which is decorated with a crocus motif. So again, you're, you're getting a feeling for that. Most of your visitors, when they come to uh, for the tour, will have been on this particular tour. And so hopefully, uh, they'll tell you, well, we saw this or we saw that. And maybe you can choose to include that in your tour or not. You know, you have flexibility too, just like the art docent. In the European gallery, here we have flowers in a glass vase by Ambrose Brochard. Uh, he was extremely important in helping uh, floral still lifes become very popular, both he and his father and uncle. And of course, you can parallel that with our, the tulips in our garden, or you could talk about spring blooms. There are lots of ways to draw these two particular ones together. And sometimes it's just the reference. So if you don't feel like you want to learn all the data on the art, you don't have to. But just knowing that we have that in the gallery, and if they really enjoy these spring blooms, say, well, you know, you may want to, after the garden tour, go into the European gallery. We have lots of great uh, tulip and other blooming flowers on display there. Uh, back in the American Gallery, we have uh, Robert Vanot's poppies. And of course, we have the Saladin poppies here on the property as well. So another great combination between the two as a whole. And of course, here we have some spirea on the right, and then John Sharman uh, at the end of the porch. Uh, John Sharman was very, very keen on including flowers in his paintings, plants in his paintings. He often talked about the condition that women at that time are going through. And here you can see it's a bright, sunny sun porch, and yet somehow it's very shadowy and overcast. And yet there were always flowers in the background as well to sort of kind of heighten the mood of the painting. Well, it's not just flowers. We have lots of trees to make the connections as well here. Uh, the Hudson River School, which was the first group of American artists that really um, imbued, shall we say, the American landscape with a certain nobility, including several great artists who loved to paint uh, plants, including Asher Duran, who loved to paint oak trees. So again, if you're out in the garden for everyone, you're look, or at our uh, great, great oak island out there, a great way of saying, you know, in the American galleries, if you can't remember the name, in the American galleries, there's some marvelous artists who really captured oak trees well on cameras. Uh, John Bundy, Monarch Beach is another example. If you've never seen this, this to me is actually breathtaking. I, I'm still amazed he was able to capture uh, the beauty of the tree <laughs> in this particular canvas. Uh, he's a Richmond artist, again, a very huge connection with that. And both he and John Forsythe, who was a member of the Hoosier group, um, Bundy was part of the Richmond group. Both these Indiana groups love to, to portray Indian landscape and plants and give them the, the very unique, beautiful, beautiful treatment that showed how distinctive our landscape actually was. 
And then uh, not to forget the contemporary gallery up on the fourth floor. Here you can see Roger Brown's couple in Sumac Thicket. And of course, anyone who's given the Art and Nature Park tour knows we have lots of sumac out there. So in great ways of paralleling these particular things. And of course, uh, our ginkgo tree, the ginkgo shows up a lot in Asian art, on the decorative arts, and this particular lamp uh, has these marvelous ginkgo impressions on it as well. So again, plants, flowers, uh, there are trees, there are lots of marvelous connections between them. But it's not just the plants, it's also the hardscape, right? So here we have Celia Bowes, portrait of Mrs. Addison Harris, and she's sitting on this marvelous bench. And we have lots of benches on our property, but two particular types of benches I always like to point out. Uh, as many of you know, I'm very fond of our whispering bench, which you can see the top image there, which is at the top of the ravine garden. To the best of my knowledge, it's only one of three in Indianapolis. And uh, we have one here, this one at Marion University, and this one downtown in University Park. And not every old circular bench can be a whispering bench. Some friends and I do nothing but test circular benches when we find them. Uh, we go into properties when we see them, like, ah, there's one of them now. Let's run over there and test it out. It's the curving of the bench. The arcing of the bench has to be very specific so the sound will actually carry from one end of the bench to the other. If it's just curved and doesn't do that, it's not a whispering bench. And then, of course, not to forget our art and nature park, uh, the uh, bench around the lake that you see there in the lower image, uh, marvelously playful uh, in terms of what benches are, how we think of benches, and of course, challenges how we sit on benches and use them as well. So again, you can parallel them uh, with either the, the more formal grounds or our art and nature park. And that's one of the marvelous things about our collection. There are so many connections between the various galleries, uh, both for the docent and the garden guide. You can um, adapt accordingly. Uh, here we have this marvelous paralleling of Edward Hopper's New York, New Haven, Connecticut with our bridge for the 42nd Street Bridge because of the interurban lines. So again, you could even choose to talk about that aspect of the property and rest assured there is an artwork in our collection that could parallel that very nicely. Here we have the canal morning effect by Richard Gruel, and of course we have our marvelous canal behind Lily House. Again, just another great connection between the two of them. And then we had Ernest Lawson's April, which parallels very nicely with our ravine garden. But again, you're not limited just to these particular images. You can see lots of other transportation-based or landscape-based images in our collection. For example, in the European connection, you can see your landscape with Cascade with Rysdale. So again, you can talk about that ravine garden in connection with that. One of my great delights was this particular image by Benjamin West, Woodcutters in Windsor Park, because the image you're seeing there in the upper left-hand corner, uh, they are preparing to clear out what becomes the great long walk at Windsor Castle. And although in my mind's eye, our alley is like the great long walk, <laughs> uh, it's a great parallel between the two because the, the effects was exactly the same. The, the idea of this long stretch of land, uh, really trying to make a very impressive uh, statement for the most part, and using the landscape around either side of that long stretch of land uh, to achieve that effect. So great, a great connection. But it doesn't always have to be about our, our plants or our landscape. It can be about what we do here. You know, we have our beer garden that looks very festive. And of course, here we have uh, Bologna's The Concert, about 1615. You know, we've, we've been partying as humans for a long time. <laughs> We like to show in our artwork. <laughs> and so I could have picked anything out of the Asian gallery or out of the ancient gallery. Uh, there are lots of great connections of, uh, that we can stretch just a little. Here we have Still Life, Pro uh, Still Life with Profile of Vol by Paul Gauguin, and, uh, and of course, Jonathan. And uh, all my volunteers are very happy because we got that look the same way that Laval's looking, so we felt these paralleled very nicely. Uh, both Gauguin and Cezanne were great drawers of apples, uh, so another great connection to our orchards. And, uh, and, uh, and just a great way to, to, to promote our horticulturists here, because I do that all the time on the tour. I tell them what a great staff we have, what they do to help keep the property going forward. So again, you're not limited just to the plants, to the landscape, you can talk about the humans that make that all happen too. Then, of course, our lake would be very nicely parallel with the lake here shown in Bedeau's, the Parc of Mort Fontaine. Again, just another connection allowing people to see uh, the galleries. And the whole idea is to pique their interest. You know, we're not trying to give them the academic lecture or the botanical tour that is so extensive they have to take notes. We're trying to get them to go and see the galleries, and if they're in the galleries, come out and see the gardens, where we want them to have a great time. 
And of course, you just heard them talk about turtles. We have lots of turtles in our collection. Uh, the terrine that's on the left there is in our decorative arts gallery, which is, I believe, right now closed. They're doing some renovation to that. But rest assured, we have lots of turtles in the Asian collection and several turtles up in the contemporary collection. So uh, we are very fond of turtles in art and, um, and another, another nice parallel. And of course, one of my favorite here. <laughs> You knew I was going to get funky bones in there somehow. And you can tie it in many ways. So while you're talking out there in Art Nature Park, talking about funky bones, be aware of the, in the middle here, the Vanitas, still life by Mr. Falk. Uh, Vanitas's were, uh, they were Dutch, and they were paintings largely designed to remind you of the, the, the impermanence of life. The Dutch um, were getting very wealthy at this particular time and becoming rather uncomfortable with all that wealth and enjoying it. They even had a term for it called the embarrassment of riches. And so this spawned this whole little small thing of art where you have these uh, watches and wisps of smoke and oranges that were starting to decompose and skeletons, of course, all of which were to remind these very busy Dutch people while they were making their money that life is very short and very impermanent. So another great connection. Or you can go with something much more whimsical. These two pieces are actually displayed close to each other in the European galleries. Ermin Worms, One Minute Forever Yogurt Cup, where we have a very humorous approach to this whole idea of material things, uh, the skeleton and the passing of life. Um, many paintings in our collection uh, could be broadly based to be used with any of our gardens. This is just one good example of that. Our garden, for everyone being the most accessible, we get lots of beautiful color photographs and there are lots of people linger in there. Very easy to tie them into any one of the particular paintings that are in our gallery. And again, you don't have to memorize all the titles of the paintings of the artists. If you want to, that's great. But you just know that in the European gallery, on any given day, you're going to have three or four very brightly colored uh, uh, landscapes or uh, paintings that allow you to see gardens views. And then as spring moves into summer, as we have our invasion of snails, our spring tour, all those spring things, the, cro the crocuses and the bluebells and those sort of things, will drop out and we will insert uh, uh, flowers and plants of summer and of fall. And, uh, and in our programs too, you know, day of flight is not in the spring typically. There's no reason that the, that cannot be promoted earlier on in the year. Uh, we also, uh, just a little side note, not every artist loved to paint flowers. Uh, William Merritt Chase did not. He found the very most difficult things to paint. And as he got more famous and more successful, his flowers began to get simpler, then smaller, then impressionistic, then they became dots on a canvas, then they disappeared altogether. So <laughs> sad, he's obviously very good at painting flowers, but uh, not every one of our, of our artists enjoyed the floral the way we do. And again, a nice parallel, because he very boldly tried to capture a hummingbird, which as we all know, is a very difficult animal to paint. And then, of course, the winter is no exception. This is a contemporary piece, Joan Mitchell's Diablo, uh, Neige et Fleur. It's in our contemporary gallery. Uh, she was fascinated with the way the flowers bust up out of the snow, like crocuses and hellebores. And so she decided to try to uh, do something abstract with that. So she was very famous for taking paint and putting it on a canvas and letting it run to see kind of what it would do, and then turning it to see what it would do. And so here she's got this, actually there's a whole series of paintings, uh, which this is one uh, called Snow and Flowers by Diablo, uh, which parallels again nicely with our winter activities. Any questions? I know it's kind of going through that real quickly because of time, but yes. Yes, the Hello Spring docent tours done by the uh, art docents are Tuesday through Friday at 2. At the end of that, since we normally don't have a, a 2.30 or 3 o'clock garden tour, they'll be giving maps to go and encouraged to go out in the gardens to wander. And then on Saturday, the garden tour is at 12.30, or excuse me, the art docent tour is at 12.30, so that 1 o'clock those guests can be brought down to the garden guide tour. Our theory is they will want to continue this. And while they don't have to see the exact three or four pieces they saw on the art tour, the idea is to get them interconnected back and forth. And hopefully this works well. Next year we can expand that to make it work more the other way as well. Uh, 12.30 on Saturday. Uh, it's the Hell of Spring Sorry, no, kicked off today and goes through May 27th. And then the blue snail, the invasion of those animals, uh, June 2nd through August 25th. And it's called Summer Wonderland Spectacular Creatures. Other questions or comments? If not, thank you for your time.
I'd like to get started again so we can uh, stay on closer to schedule. Um, I want to bring up uh, Jamie Fry. She is our assistant horticulturalist, but also our plant record specialist. Um, she would probably get about four or five more titles right after that because she does everything for us. Um, she's great at communicating all of the timing of what's blooming to not just the garden guides, but to the entire museum marketing um, design, everybody. So she's been working a great deal on this and closely with the horticulturalist so she can give more detail about the plantings. So I will take the gift to her. Give it to her. Thanks, Chad, and good morning, friends. Um, so this is going to be a whirlwind tour of the plants that we planted for what I'm still calling spring blooms. Um, so we have worked really, really hard. Um, but just so you know, we sort of mentioned this earlier, uh, this PowerPoint all of my crazy person notes, um, as well as a recording of today's presentations will be available online. I'm gonna work with Chris Moorhead to get that ready for y'all. So don't feel like you need to take notes right now. If you wanna jot something down that you find really interesting, great. If you just wanna sort of hold on for the ride, we have a lot to go through. Um, so as Chad said, I am the um, assistant horticulturist and plant record specialist. So what that means is I handle everything from checking the names of all of our plants because those taxonomists and those crazy people selling all those plants, they like to change stuff up on us. Um, so we're kind of making sure that we are representing the most current correct name to to both you and our guests. Um, so I handle that. I deal with our database because like the art collections, um, we have collections too, and they are tracked like the art collections. However, our collections are alive and sort of have a mind of their own. So they decide to move on us, they die on us, they don't just sit where they're stored all nice and polite. Um, so we have to be really good about knowing what we have in our collections, knowing where they came from, um, and sort of being able to track these things across time. Um, because we do sort of have the tendency as public gardens to try new things. And if you were at our symposium this last winter, um, you might have seen Michael Dosman's talk, and he was talking about how, as public gardens, we tend to be the introducers of some naughty plants, all by accident, not on purpose. However, tracking things, um, that's an important part of our job, because it's good to know where these things came from, um, and how much we have, or where we might have, if it's something that we need to eradicate from our collections. Um, so I do a lot of the communication to y'all um, and the rest of our staff here at the museum. You will probably get weekly updates from me. Estelle, do you pass, you pass those on? Darlene passes them on. Um, and she does a wonderful job of adding images to them for you. But you will get crazy obsessive lists from me all spring. Um, so originally when we made this talk, I was going to talk about when the specific flowers bloom. But I think I'm going to hold off on that for this time because it's all very weather dependent. Um, and you will be getting those weekly updates from me. So you will know when things start to bloom and when to start looking out for them. So. Let's begin. Um, I am a numbers person because of my job tracking everything. I deal with the numbers. Um, this is a lot of numbers. They will be on the notes. Don't fret about them. But what I think is really, really cool about this year specifically is we may have planted less bulbs last fall than we did the previous, about 130,000. Um, but we planted a lot more different types of things. So we're going to have a much more diverse spring show this year. So we had about 99 more different types of bulbs this year than we did last year, um, and about 50 additional types of annuals this year. So it's going to be a lot more diverse, a lot more interesting, a lot more depth. Um, so I thought that was really kind of cool. And then, um, as Jonathan had mentioned, we kept about 70,000 bulbs from spring 2017 in our collection. So every year, we're just going to get to add more and more spring pizzazz. Um, I am also the crazy label lady. So 
So um, I am the one who engraves all of our labels. Um, I just sort of wanted to give you a heads up on what you can expect to see in the labels and where you can expect to find them. So all of our display labels, which are the two larger square ones, will have the common name up at the top. Um, I like to include common name because sometimes you can get some sort of more specific information about where the plant is from or something about it, um, like imperial fritillary. Um, and then below that will always be the Latin name. The Latin name is the name you will hear me use the most. It's the one that's most easily recognized on an international level. It's usually the most botanically correct. Um, and then you'll either see um, the cultivar name or cultivated name if it's a cultivated plant or the family name. I like to include family name because you can make some really interesting connections between different types of plants, realizing oh, I didn't realize that erysimum was related to broccoli. Like, you make a lot of really interesting connections based on the family. Um, and then for things that are not of a cultivated nature, a named cultivated nature, we also include the native range, um, because that, I think that's really interesting information where our plants come from in the wild. Um, oh, I'm gonna, actually going to go back. With the labels, um, you should see most of our bulb labels out already. We have a few stragglers that need to go out, but for the most part, our bulb labels are already out in the garden. You will typically find one label for each plant within sight distance. So if we have two beds very close together, um, you will often find one of the beds labeled if they have the same plants and the other one not so labeled. We don't want to make our gardens look like a cemetery with all of these little labels in a row. Um, the only place that's really like that is the cutting garden just because Irvin has so many kinds of tulips in there, it's ridiculous. Um, so I try to limit the amount. Um, you will usually find them in the first incidence as you're going along the path. So like as you're walking up to GFE, take a look to your left, take a look to your right, you'll probably see the label for those plants very, very soon after you approach them. They will always be within a few feet of the path. I do not like to put labels really far back in the bed. Um, so kind of as you're looking for them, keep an eye out in those places because that's where you're most likely to find them. Um, I kind of want to talk about bulbs for a second. So um, we kind of blanketly call everything bulbs. We planted bulbs. We planted 130,000 bulbs. But not everything is actually a bulb. Botanically speaking, um, bulbs are actually fleshy leaf and flower tissue used for energy storage. So in the above, I think it's a hyacinth picture, you can actually see the leaves that are um, storage around the flower bud. So that is technically, botanically a bulb. Um, but we also plant Corms. So corms are these little crocus down at the bottom. And that's actually modified stem tissue. So it's stem tissue that's creating that storage. And it usually has a basal plate and a growing point. Um, more often seen in summer plantings are our tubers, like our dahlias. So that's um, root tissue that's been modified to store a ton of carbohydrates for all that good energy. And then we also see rhizomes and things like cucaras and iris. And those are root tissues that run laterally along the ground. And, produce pips, which are the little baby plants. So good things to know that not everything is necessarily a bulb, like our Eremaris, our foxtail lily, which we'll talk about later, are actually rhizomes. Um, we plant them in the fall with the bulbs. We plant them like the bulbs, but they're not technically botanically a bulb. So fun little interesting tidbit that you can tell people as you're walking them around. Um, we're going to get into the bulbs now. I'm kind of just going to fly through all of this really fast. Um, if you were here last year, it's going to be very similar to my talk last year, but with some different additional information. So we're, for the most part, going to go A to Z. We'll do the bulbs. We'll do the annuals. It's going to be a whole bunch of fun. So um, this year, our horticulturists really embraced the allium. The alliums are nice because they sort of extend our bulb season, but they come in all sorts of different sizes, shapes, and colors. So everything from this Caritaviense up here, which is this really short, squat, kind of chunky little bulb, um, to something like the Allium spherocephalon in the bottom right-hand corner, um, the drumstick Allium, which is a little bit more elegant and 
kind of a deep sort of burgundy mauve color. Um, and then we have lots and lots and lots of those beautiful Allium giganteums like we saw last year, the big sort of balls on a stick. They're really cute. It's a really great way to add diversity and lengthen the season. Um, they are relatives to edible onions and garlics, and they actually, the scent all comes from a sulfur derivative amino acid called, I think it's cysteine. Um, so that's why they all sort of have that same oniony, garlicky smell that's so traditional for the garlics. Um, we also have anemones. So these guys are actually starting to bloom right now. So anemone blanda. Um, I would love it if somebody could get a good picture of these guys this year. I have not found a good picture of anemone blanda that blows up really well in the landscape. So if you manage to get one, I have a whole bag of Snickers in my desk drawer. I will, I will bribe you with Snickers to find me a good picture of these guys. Um, but it's a really, really sweet little plant. Um, it comes from anemos in Greek, which means wind, um, and blanda, which means mild or charming. And these little guys are certainly charming. It's a pretty early bloomer. They're really low to the ground. Sweet whites and purples and lavenders. They're just really stinking cute. Um, it's a nice sort of precursor to the big, bulky, va va voom tulips to come. Um, it's sort of a nice primer for all those bright colors. Um, this is a fun one. It's new to us this year. It's called Bellavalia. Um, it looks like a grape hyacinth because it used to be classified as a grape hyacinth. So this little guy has actually, it's really taxonomically messy. It's been classified as a hyacinth. It's been classified as a muscari. They had no clue what it actually was until they did the genetic research on it. So they really, really, really wanted it to be a grape hyacinth for a long time. But then they realized it has like eight extra chromosomes or something crazy like that. So they took it out of hyacinth. They're calling it Bellavalia now. Um, what's really fascinating is the ones that we have in our collection could actually be a lighter blue than this image um, because the coloration depends on the seed source. So depending on where our source got their plants, um, the Turkish seed sources, specifically Turkey, I'm not sure why, is this really, really dark blue, and the seed sources from all of their other native ranges tend to be a lighter blue. So that's sort of a little fun fact that you can tell people when you see this. Um, you will have access to a list of all of the plants as well as um, a list with images. So you can sort of see where these little guys are gonna be this spring, and that's really the best way to know that it's these versus a grape hyacinth. There's really no good way for me to tell you how to tell the difference unless you can map chromosomes in your spare time, which I know I can't. So um, the best way is to sort of, I believe Patty has got them in the front of her border garden and Irvin may have them in Noni's garden, but double check me on that when you get your lists. Uh, then we have Camassia. Camassia is a really, really fun one. Chad had these in Garden for Everyone last year. Um, it's cool because it's a Western native, so it's native to the Western part of the United States, um, and it's a traditional food source for the Western indigenous peoples. Um, I'm sure most of you know the story of the pawpaw, right? How it saved Lewis and Clark and all that fun stuff. Well, Camassia did the same thing. Apparently, Lewis and Clark's expedition ran out of food a lot. So, so when they met up with the Nez Perce Indians somewhere outside of, I think, Colorado-ish, um, they were starving. They had no food left, um, and these indigenous peoples were harvesting them like potatoes. So what they actually used to do is they would, um, while they were in flour, harvest huge swaths of these camassia, and they would roast them in the fire, and then they would dry them for food storage over the winter. And anything that was really too small to be starchy and good, they would cut up, repropagate, and replant. So they were basically doing like modern agriculture with these camassia. And so when Lewis and Clark stumbled upon them, they're like, here, take these with you. They're starchy, they're good, they'll help feed you and get you through. So this is another one of those sort of great westward exploration plant stories. 
Um, we have Kyanodoxa. So the main Kyanodoxa were actually planted a couple years ago. So this is Glory of the Snow. This is a little white one. Um, these are actually blooming now too. So you remember the daffodils by Spider Boy in the rec lawn last year? The big sort of, I can't remember if we were calling it a parterre or it was sort of like a swirl of daffodils in the lawn last year. These are actually planted within that swirl. We didn't see a lot of them last year, but they're up this year and they're really, really darn cute. Um, my, one of my kind of trickiest things is telling the difference between Kyanodoxa and Scylla, which we'll go over Scylla, I think, next. But Kyanodoxa tends to be very upward facing. Um, and the actual floral parts, the um, sexual organs, tend to all be clumped together like a cone in the middle. Um, it also typically has yellow pollen, where a lot of Scyllas have blue pollen. Um, so if you're confused between the two, just think about, you know, the Kyanodoxa is a closed cone, Kyanodoxa closed. Um, but yeah, you should definitely check these out in the rec field when the snow melts because you won't be able to see them today, but <laughs> definitely go out there and check them out. Um, and then we have our Scylla. So Scylla is really, really diverse. It comes in all sorts of shapes, colors, and sizes, usually pale blues and pinks. Um, and Scylla is just one of those adorable little harbingers of spring. We have uh, Siberica in our border gardens, Garden for Everyone, um, at the Three Graces bed. We have uh, Scylla Mishankawana, which is just finishing up now um, in the very, very back of the southwest border garden, Patty's border garden, as you're walking from Garden Terrace to the Three Graces bed. It's this adorable little blue Scylla that's just covering the ground. Um, it kind of looks like snow melt, although you wouldn't be able to tell today. Um, and like I said before, the Kyanodoxa sort of has closed stamens, um, but you can see here the Scylla is much more open. So if you're not sure how to tell the difference between the two, that's the major difference. Um, and the cool thing about Scylla is a lot of the pollen is blue, and you can actually see that on the bees coming back in early spring. They'll have some blue pollen, and sometimes you know, beekeepers are like, what is going on? What is this? If they're not familiar with it, and a lot of times it's from the Scylla, not an M&M &M factory, although that happens too. <laughs> Um, then we have our crocus. Our crocus are kind of going strong right now. Um, adorable little guys, real early. By the time you start giving tours, they may be starting to wind down. Um, but fun thing about crocus is the name crocus actually means yolk or saffron, depending on the original language, um, and it's talking about those stamens. So not the crocus that we necessarily have in the garden, but crocus sativus is the source for saffron, um, like the cooking herb. So um, it has a long tradition in culinary history, um, but we sort of just get to enjoy them for their pretty purple flowers and their beautiful, beautiful yellow centers and knowing that spring is coming, even if it's snowing outside. And then we have our Eremaris, or Eremaris, depending on how you want to say it. Um, so these guys are foxtail lilies. These will be some of the latest bloomers. I know Irvin's got them in front of the museum building outside of Ephraimson. Um, and Gwen has a bunch of them in Four Seasons. She was telling me the other day that her goal is to get people to stop and wet their pants because they're going to be so pretty. That's, that's what she wants. Um, so they're these really, really tall blooms of color, um, usually in the whites, yellows, and oranges range. Um, they're kind of finicky. They need really good drainage. So what we did this year, for Gwen's at least, because there were those huge blue trees for winter lights in Four Seasons, we actually planted them in pots in pretty much gravel and covered them up for the winter, uncovered them and dug them into the ground last week. So they're looking really good. They're looking really, really promising. So look forward to those. Um, this is what I mentioned earlier is actually a rhizome that we plant in the fall. So this picture on the right, it's like they're these funky little sea creature looking alien things. Um, and then they end up being these beautiful flowers. And then we have our fritillaria. So we all loved those fritillaria persica, these tall purple ones in front of Lily. Um, both Patty and Gwen are using the white version of that, so it's called ivory bells. Um, and it's sort of a whitish green, but the same flower structure. But we have a ton of different fritillaria that went in this year. I think there was five or six. Um, they come in a crazy diverse 
amount of shapes, sizes, and colors. So one of my favorites up here is Fritillaria meleagris. So it's a European native. Um, it's called checkered lily. Another thing about my labels and my common names is anytime it's not truly botanically what the common name calls it, like checkered lily, it's a Fritillaria, it's not a lily, there will be a hyphen in there. So it's checkered hyphen lily. So if you ever see a common name from me that's got a hyphen in it, or it looks like the word's squished together when it shouldn't be, it's because it's not botanically the common name we're calling it. So fun little tip there. These checkered lilies are really, really sweet. They're little bell-shaped flowers. Um, and the Latin name, Fritillaria meleagris, the species comes from meleagris, like the turkey. That's actually the genus name for turkey. Um, and they sort of go hand in hand because of that checkering pattern. Um, so I always thought that was kind of cool. And then this little fr fritillaria down here is in the overlook. It's fritillaria mykolovskii. Uh, Patty's got some fritillaria radiana. Um, in front of the greenhouse. There are a lot of them out there, and I think you'll be really, really surprised at how different they all are from one another and how unique and fun they can all be. Most of them are from sort of the Middle East, Turkey, Kazakhstan, um, but that Meliagris is one of the few European ones. Um, then we have Galanthus. So the Galanthus are finishing up right now, but I have to include them. Chad put a ton of them in Garden for Everyone, and they were just cute as buttons this year. Um, they really readily naturalize around England and Europe. The English are just bananas for these. We call them galanthophiles. There's actually a closeted galanthophile in the audience right now, Jonathan. <laughs> um, but like every little variation, every little extra ruffle, every other little green coloration gets galanthophiles super excited. Um, what was interesting is monks actually used to sort of harvest these. They've for a really long time been a symbol of chastity and purity, especially in religious circles. Um, and we think that the common name, the snowdrop, comes from a 16th century style of earring called the drop earring. Um, so just, you know, fun little facts for our galanthophile friends. Um, I'm sure we'll be getting more fun little galanthus in the garden if Jonathan has anything to do with it. Um, and then we have our summer snowflakes, our leucogem. Um, we used a lot of leucogem gravidi giant this year. Gravidi giant was named after the gravidi manor, which was the hortic which was the place where the horticulturist who found this sort of larger, beefier form worked. Um, Galanthus, the summer snowflake common name, is sort of misleading because it's actually a mid-spring bloomer. Um, and if you're afraid that you're going to get this and Galanthus confused, don't be. It's not really even close. The galanthus are finishing blooming now. now. The leucogem haven't started yet. Uh, the leucogem also have much more sort of closed, almost single layer flowers, unlike the galanthus has those outer big droopy petals and then the inner, inner bits. Um, and the leucogem tend to be bigger, beefier plants. So these guys are absolutely stunning. They're gonna be in that white and yellow bed that Jonathan showed you earlier that Patty did up by the Three Graces with all the whites and the blues and the yellows. It's gonna be pretty cool. Um, and then we have Gladiolus communist subspecies Byzantius. <laughs> That's a mouthful, right? Um, so it's a really fun spring flowering glad. Um, it's semi-hardy for us here, bright, bright pink colors. The cool thing to know is gladiolus actually means sword-like, and it's referencing those lance-like leaves. Um, so this is a really fun one. Helen is really, really fond of this plant. She loves pink and purple. So you'll see this in a lot of her plantings. I think specific Specifically, the Woodstock bed will have some of these this year. So look forward to those. It's going to be one of the latest things in spring blooms this year. So one extra thing for you to tell your tour guests later on in the season. And then we have our hyacinthoides. So hyacinthoides gets its name because it looks kind of like hyacinth. Um, Spanish bluebells is the common name. Um, really, really sweet, funky little plant. They can sort of come in a range of pastel -y colors. Um, but this is one that we're kind of keeping an eye on. It has actually escaped cultivation in some western states, so it sort of has seeded around and become a little naughty. Um, we haven't really seen that here, but like I mentioned, this is why we track things. We know what we 
have where we have it and why we have it. Um, so that way, if it ever does become a little bit naughty, we'll be able to sort of nip it in the bud and get rid of it when we need to, because that's what curation and collections is all about, is making those hard decisions and kind of enjoying it when you kill things. <laughs> Um, then we have our regular hyacinths, so these are actually starting to bloom right now. We have a whole plethora of colors from pinks to yellows to blues, light blues, dark blues, double royal navies that Helen's got in the woodstock bed, you name it. Um, these guys are really going to start cranking in the next week or so, especially with these warmer days ahead. Super, super fragrant. Um, I think I mentioned this last year, but the traditional use for hyacinth bulb was actually as glue for book binding and as starch for clothes, which if you've ever planted hyacinth and know how itchy they are, I really can't imagine putting these on my clothes. Um, but the other really cool thing about these guys is they had really strong national color preferences in like the 1700s. So like the English folks really, really loved the yellow ones and the Germans really loved the pink ones. And there was a really bizarre national color preference for hyacinth. Um, and they actually sort of enjoyed their own little bulb bloom, or bulb boom, I should say. Around the same time that tulip mania, which we'll talk about in a little bit, was getting going, some of these hyacinths could go for like $11,000 a bulb, which I can't imagine paying <laughs> that much for anything besides maybe a galanthus. Um, <laughs> sorry, Jonathan, I'm really just killing you today. Um, yeah, so they sort of had their own little like economy attached with them for a while, which not so much anymore, thankfully, or we would probably be broke. <laughs> Our plant budget would be no more. Uh, this is a new one for us. It's called Iphion Rolf Fielder. Um, this is a really interesting little plant. It's a Uruguayan native, um, and the taxonomy on this is sort of all over the place. So the person who found this noticed that the edges of the petals were more rounded than the typical species, Iphion uniflorum. So they named it Rolf Fielder, and nobody's really sure whether or not it should actually be lumped in with the species, and it's just a funky little form, or if it should be its own species. So for right now, we're just calling it Rolf Fielder. Um, but what's unique about it is this specifically rounded form has a unique range that its species mother doesn't have. So. You might see the label on this change in the next couple of years, but um, it's a really, really sweet little mid-bloomer, let's call it. I think the, the literature says it should be early, but I count early as now, and it's like this big right now, so we're not going to call it early anymore. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is a new one for us. It's going to be in the overlook, so I'm really interested to see how it does. We haven't had it before. Um, we have our little sweet iris reticulatas. They're sort of coming to the end of their bloom, but they're still out there right now. Um, we have a bunch of these. They come everywhere from really soft, pale blues to deep, 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 sort of almost ready purples. Um, these are some of my favorite plants. They're a really, really early iris. Um, reticulata means netted, and it's referring to the sheath around the little bulb. So it's got a netted or reticulate sheath around it, um, and they're just, they're so stinking cute. I love them so much. <laughs> um, I'm really fond of the color purple, but I just think that it's a super saturated, cheery color for this early in the spring, and it really helps brighten up those dreary winter days with the witch hazels. They tend to come at the same time, so I'm quite fond of them. Um, but we do have another little iris. It's the Dutch iris is what we call it, or iris hollandicum. Um, we're not really sure that that's a legit hybrid species. Um, so the Dutch iris, iris hollandicum, is actually a couple of Iberian, which if you don't know, Iberian Peninsula is like Spain, Portugal, that area. So it's a couple of irises crossed from that region. Um, it's actually one of the most popular irises in the florist trade. We have two of them this year. This is Eye of the Tiger, which I think Chad planted in GFE, and then we have Montecito, which Patty planted in front of the Three Graces bed. Um, but what's really interesting about this is these little Dutch irises 
tend to share a name with their larger bearded cousins, which makes things real confusing. So there is also a bearded iris called Eye of the Tiger. And there's also a bearded iris called Montecito. So don't get too confused. The label will say Dutch iris. Um, and they bloom at completely different times. But these are really, really gorgeous. And it's worth all of the name confusion. OK, and here's where we get to a fun couple of new ones. So I believe this one is tri oh, no, sorry, it's Ixiolirion, which is a Western Asian native. Um, it's a later blooming bulb, and it's got a pretty open flower structure. So you'll see why I was confused in a moment, because we also have what is uh, Tritelia, or used to be Brodia. Um, which is basically a native to our west coast. It looks super, super similar. Um, again, I will have you refer to those lists that I'm gonna make sure are sent out, because the best way to tell them apart is to know which one's in which area. Um, because I haven't seen them in person yet, and I doubt a lot of you have seen them in person yet, and for me, I know figuring out the difference between who's who really comes when I see both of them. So supposedly, this other guy, the Ixiolirion, is supposed to have a more open bloom. The Tritelia is supposed to be a more closed bloom, maybe a more intense color. Um, but the common name for the Tritelia is actually um, Ethereal Spear. And it's a really vague reference to some religious works. Um, it's kind of interesting. Look it up. Um, it's sort of a funky little vague Jewish story. Um, so yeah, I had, a, I had an interesting time trying to figure out where that common name came from. And then we have our mascari. We love our grape hyacinth here. Uh, they come in lots and lots of different colors. As you can see, the orchard was full of them last year, and we put even more in this year. A lot of people include them in their plantings. They're just really really adorable little plants. Um, they're predominantly found in Western Asia. Um, and you can actually use them as a marker for where you've planted other bulbs. A lot of Muscari's foliage comes up in the fall. So if you plant Muscari with your other bulbs, and you go to plant in the fall, and you're like, hey, there's some muscari foliage here. I've already put something in this spot. You might not plant over what you've already got. And then we have our daffodils. We love our daffodils. Um, there are a ton of them. There are a lot of different kind of options and choices. Some of the best daffodil breeders out there are actually um, amateurs and enthusiasts. So people who just like daffodils create some of the really, really cool, funky ones that end up actually going to trade and getting picked up. Um, so Narcissus, the Latin name, comes from the Greek root narco, which means to become numb. So the bulbs are actually fairly toxic, <laughs> and if you eat them, which I do not recommend, do not eat them, um, they will make your whole mouth kind of go numb and feel really funny. Um, but there's also reference to the Greek myth of Narcissus, who um, sort of spurned um, Echo, who is the wood nymph, and she basically cursed him to um, fall in love with the first face that he saw, which he looked into the pond, and that face happened to be his own. So that's sort of where we get narcissist from. Um, and so we actually have a representative of all 13 daffodil divisions on our campus somewhere, at least according to the database. That doesn't mean it's what's alive, but we think we have a representation of all 13 daffodil types. So I'm going to read through them super, super fast. Um, we're going to go like we're reading, so top to bottom, left to right. Um, so there's division one, which is the trumpet long cupped. Then we have the large cupped. Um, so the, the trumpet long cupped is one flower per stem, and the corona, which is sort of that trumpet, is as long or longer than the petals, um, versus the large cupped, which is the trumpet, is one third to as long as the petals. It's a super, super specific definition. I cannot remember it without looking it up, so that's OK that you don't know all of this. Then we have the small cupped. We have our doubles. Uh, we have our triandrus our Cyclamineus, our Jonquillas, our Tazettas, our Poeticus, our Hoop Petticoat, 
our split cup, and then we have miscellaneous and species, and that's basically everything else. So what you'll see in the garden when it comes to the labels is um, the Latin names will all be, you know, specifically Narcissus and then the cultivar, but the common names are going to have that division name. So the common name for all these are going to be long-cupped daffodil or, you know, Tazetta daffodil or split-cupped daffodil. So that will sort of help you figure out where they fall in those divisions. Um, I think it just makes it easier for the daffodil people to split them up. Um, if you want to learn anything at all about daffodils, uh, daffseek.org is the American Daffodil. Daffodil Society, and they have more information than you will ever want to know. That's the source that I go to for checking my daffodil names. It will tell you the breeder, when it was registered, have pictures, all that fun stuff. So if you ever have a daffodil question, daffseek.org is the place to go. Um, then we have this little cute Oxalis adenophila. Um, so this is a little alpine plant. Uh, Katie's trying it in the overlook right now. They're coming up. Um, kind of all along the path, and they're these cute little pin cushions of silvery foliage. Um, we should be seeing these rosy pink flowers a little bit later in the season. Um, it's a new one for us, a new one that we're going to try, um, another South American native. And it's actually not that far from that little Uruguayan native that I talked about earlier. All right, now we're going to get to our friend tulips. We love our tulips, right? Uh, we planted about 68,000 tulips this year. Um, and the first thing I want to talk about is this picture specifically. So this picture was from last year. Um, and it's really funny because you see all of these cute little pink tulips that are the same. And then there's this odd little striped one in the bunch. Um, so I kind of want to talk about this odd tulip in the bunch um, because there are a lot of different reasons for those odd tulips in the bunch. Um, one of them, which I don't think is this specific one, but could be a reason, is um, something called tulip breaking virus. So I'm not sure if you've already heard about this, but there was the Dutch tulip mania in the kind of early to mid 1630s in the Netherlands. Um, so just prior to that, actually around the time of that, was it Venitas, Oren, <laughs> that Dutch painting? So right around the time of that Venitas painting, um, the Dutch both had a war with Spain, so they had a war with the Spanish and had a lot of casualties. Um, and there was also a plague that sort of ripped through the country. So suddenly there was a shortage of workers, which led to an increase in wages. So suddenly these Dutch folks had all this money and um, didn't quite know what to do with that. So let's bring us to a little earlier, late 1590s, uh, Carlos Clusius, who was a Dutch plant explorer, brought tulips back to the Netherlands for the first time. Um, and so he brought them from Turkey, these little wild, you know, small tulips, and he started breeding them and sort of messing with them. And he was a very sort of quiet, closed off person. He didn't like to, you know, flaunt that he had all of this beautiful stuff. Um, but it got out, and one of the things that he had were these broken tulips. So these tulips that have this really wild coloration and streaking, and people just thought they were stunning and would go crazy for them. Um, and what actually happened is poor Clusius got broken into like eight times in the sp span of like a year. And so his beautiful broken tulips were stolen, and all of his hard breeding work was stolen, and he eventually just gave up and said, I don't want to do this anymore more and quit breeding tulips, which I think is a travesty. I think we would have a lot more interesting tulips today had he kept going. Um, but basically, that's how feverish this got. Um, people just wanted to buy these tulips as a status symbol. They wanted to buy them to say, hey, I've got money. I'm going to spend it. Um, and so they spent absurd amounts of money on these tulips um, that were so ephemeral and not long lasting. That's why you see a lot of paintings of them because when people had them, they commissioned painters to paint them so that they would be able to see them outside of the three or four weeks in the year that they're actually blooming. Um, and so it got so crazy that at one point, one of these broken tulips was basically worth a farm. So it was worth, hold on, I have a list here. It was worth, um, let's see, 
18 pigs, four oxen, 12 sheep, 48 tons of rye, two hogs head of wine, four barrels of beer, two tons of clothing, 1,000 pounds of cheese, a bow, and there were a few extra things. One tulip bulb, one. Um, so <laughs> what is interesting about these is it is a virus that caused them. So basically what happens is after two or three years, the plant would just quit. It didn't have any more energy to do this. The virus had taken its toll. So it was so fleeting and so ephemeral that eventually the tulip bubble burst. Some people like lost their whole life fortune because they had spent money on these tulips. Um, but we were sort of left with the remnants of these tulips today. So they were bred as the division that we call Rembrandt tulips. Um, we no longer see official actual Rembrandt tulips in the trade, um, but we do still see broken tulips. And that's usually a cause of a random mutation or some really intense breeding practices. When you see them now, it's no longer because of the virus. Um, but I think, you know, kind of seeing the odd tulip in the bunch is a really good time to sort of talk about that. Um, the other sort of couple things why we might have an odd tulip in the bunch is tulips will randomly shoot up mutations sometimes. So that's sometimes how we get these funky different ones. And that's actually how we get most of our new tulip cultivars is sort of these funny little mutations. Um, but the way that they field produce too is they pull up all of the tulips at once, they size them, and Anybody big enough, they sell. Everybody's too small, they put back in the fields. So sometimes things get jumbled in that process. And sometimes things get jumbled around in our process too. Because we have the process of planting tons and tons, 130,000 bulbs a year. And then a lot of them we pull up so we can try new designs the next year. So sometimes friends get left behind and they show up as the odd tulip in the bunch. And then I wanted to talk really quickly about another fun piece of, well, not so fun, piece of history, um, which was the Dutch tulip famine. So we're going to another war, World War II. Um, the, it was called the Winter Famine of 1944 to 1945. Uh, the Netherlands were occupied by Germany. They had basically closed off all shipping routes, um, so there was no way for the Dutch people to get food. Their sort of breadline rations had been cut all the way back to about 500 calories a day. I know I can eat 500 calories in a snack, um, so I can't even imagine how hard that was for people. But because of the war, the um, farmers had planted the tulips that year. So what they resorted to was eating these sad, wrinkled, dried tulips. So you can find all sorts of old recipes for like tulip soup and <laughs> boiled tulips. Um, and supposedly fresh tulips are not actually that bad to eat if you cook them the right way. Um, some people say it's kind of like a potato, but these guys were eating gross, gnarly tulips. So there are actually still some folks today who cannot stand the sight of a tulip bulb because they remember having to eat them in soups. Um, so it's sort of an unfortunate piece of tulip history, but another important one nonetheless. Um, there's a Dutch saying about, you know, you don't know hunger, you know want. So you don't know the true meaning of having an empty belly. You just know wanting food. And that sort of comes from this tradition or this piece of history of the Dutch tulip famine. So um, fortunately, we are not eating tulips. We are looking at them and how pretty they are. So we're going to do a single, similar thing with the daffodils. Um, it's broken into divisions. Um, and we have all but the Rembrandts in the show this year. So again, like we're reading left to right, top to bottom. Um, we have the single early tulips, the double early tulips, the triumph tulips, our Darwin hybrids, our single lates, our lily flowering. Um, we have our fringed, our veritifloras, the Rembrandts, which that's that Semper Augustus that was worth an entire farm, um, but we no longer really see in the trade. Uh, we have our beautiful parrot tulips, our double late tulips, our Kaufmanniana tulips, which is anything derived from Tulipa Kaufmanniana. There's actually one behind the lily house and in the cutting garden right now called Corona that's blooming. It's so stinking cute. You need to go see it before they're gone. So as soon as the snow melts, get out there. They're really adorable. Um, then we have the Fosterianas, which is anything derived from Tulipa Fosteriana. The Greggiis, which similarly from Tulipa Greggii. The Species tulips, which is anything else that comes 
comes from a direct species. It's got to be a direct species, not a cultivar. Um, and then we have miscellaneous, because these bulb folks, we always have things that just don't fit into any of the other categories. So we'll just make a miscellaneous category, and anything that doesn't fit goes in there. All right, we're going to zip through the annuals real, real quick. Um, this is one that Gwen and Irvin are planting this year called Anemone Lord Lieutenant. Um, they saw it when they went to, I believe, Longwood last year and just fell in love and had to have it this year. You would be amazed at how much hemming and hawing there was trying to find this plant. Um, it's this really, really beautiful blue semi-double to fully double. Um, and interesting fact, Lord Lieutenant is a volunteer position in England appointed to one person per county by Her Majesty the Queen herself um, to represent and uphold the dignity of the crown. Um, like Jonathan mentioned earlier, um, we're going to use a lot of edible ornamentals this year. So kales, cabbages, um, mustard greens, fennel, dill, um, and bok choy. So you'll see bok choy and pak choy used almost interchangeably. It's because it's actually a bad Chinese translation. So <laughs> nobody ever figured out whether they wanted to call it bok or pak, but it comes from the same Chinese word, which actually means white cabbage. So there's your little bok choy piece of trivia for the day. Um, then we have the snapdragons. So snapdragons, or antirhinum, in Latin means snout-like. Um, our snapdragon in English, and the Indian common name, which is dog snout flower, or something along th those lines, all refer to that flower shape. Um, I'm sure all of you have done this, but the most, the easiest way to entertain a child is to find a snapdragon bloom and squeeze it on the sides and it opens its mouth kind of like a dragon. You can make some roaring noises. There's usually giggles and delight and it's wonderful and heartwarming. Um, so that's gonna be, it's gonna play more of a role this year than it did last year. We used some of them last year, even more this year, more colors, more places. They're a really, really fun plant for late season. Um, this is one that we haven't used in the last few years, right, Chad? This is fairly new for us. Arisimum or wallflower. Um, it comes in all sorts of different colors from these oranges and yellows to these really cool newer ones like passion and orchid over here that almost seem like they're like technicolor fading. Um, it's going to be really, really interesting. I'm excited to see these used. They're actually closely related to broccoli, so you never would have thought of it by looking at them, but it's a brassica. Um, we are using heucheras as an annual this year, so um, something kind of interesting. All heucheras, so everything in the genus heuchera is actually native to, the, to North America. Um, sometimes it gets a bad rap for you know, being short-lived because it's clonal, it likes to spread around. Um, but there's a huge, huge, huge range in sort of foliage, colors, shapes, sizes, um, and heucheras that do better in sun, heucheras that do better in shade. So if you have a spot, you can find a heuchera for you. Um, and Patty's using a lot of these in pots this year, I believe. Um, then we have Iberus, or a candy tuft. This is sort of an old school rock garden plant. Um, it's small, it's tough. Some places it's sort of semi-evergreen, um, and rock gardeners just adore it. It's sweet, it's cute, and it just creeps along the ground all adorable-like. And then we have our lupines. We went crazy for lupines this year, especially Gwen and Irvin. Um, they found this West Country series that had crazy, crazy colors, um, and so we are giving them a try by the hundreds this year. This is part of Gwen's Wet Your Pants campaign, uh, <laughs> but it's going to be really interesting to see. So you don't see a lot of these in the Midwest especially because they don't like heat and humidity. They want cool summers. They tend to want decent drainage, so we're going to use them as an annual. A very, very fancy annual, um, but they should be pretty amazing, and I'm really, really excited to see what they do in our garden. Um, then we have the stocks, the Matheolas. Um, so these guys are really, really cool. Um, they're sweet scented. They're also related to cabbages. A lot of our sort of spring greens are. Um, and in 19th century Germany, um, they really, really loved stock, and each village was designated a color because they didn't want cross-pollination. So if you lived in this village, you would grow 
lavender ones. If you lived in this village, you would grow white ones um, because they really wanted to be able to trade them and send them around, but they didn't want to ruin their stocks. So each little town or village had their own representative color. Um, and then we have our Nemesias. Um, Jonathan talked a little bit about our Nemesias. Um, most of the ones that you see are going to be species or hybrids out of South Africa. It's related to the snapdragons. Um, these guys we had last year, but the ones that came in yesterday, we just got a shipment in yesterday, look stunning. I think they're going to do so much more this year than they did last year. So I'm really looking forward to seeing those guys. Um, this blood orange one, which we had last year, Gwen got like 84 flats of them, which is like almost a thousand plants, if not more, for her fiery pop-up garden. Um, it's gonna be pretty impressive. I think Chad's looking to steal some from her too for GFE if he can, so you'll see those around. Um, and then we have our poppies. So we're doing Icelandic poppies this year, which the name is sort of deceiving. It's actually native to Northwestern North America and Northern Asia, so think like Kazakhstan, Mongolia. Not Iceland, I'm not, I, I think the more the better common name is probably Arctic poppy, but we've stuck with the Icelandic poppy because that's how people know them. They love cool temperatures and they've got these long slender sl stems with a whole bunch of bright colored flowers. We have oranges, yellows, whites, and pinks this year. So look for those, they're gonna be pretty cool. Um, and then we have ranunculus. So they were brought to Europe in the late 16th century by Clusius, our friend Clusius who brought the tulips. Um, and they were extremely, extremely popular as a florist plant until the mid 19th century. Um, but they've recently sort of seen an upsurgence thanks to the Dutch nursery industry. So we're looking forward to having more than just the orange this year. So we've got some sort of peachy pinks that Urban's using, some bright yellows that Patty's using. They're really fun, they're really fluffy. Um, and then we have our lovely pansies, violas. Um, so we have just about every color under the sun. There's one called fizzy lemonberry this year, which is just so adorable. It looks like somebody did bad tie-dye between yellow and purple. Like there's just all these funky streaks. It's, it's awesome. Um, the French word for pansy means um, a thought or a remembrance. So that's sort of a nice little tidbit. Um, and so traditionally, Additionally, the common name pansy refers to those big, blousy viola wetrachianas, um, while the common name viola refers to viola cornuta, which is sort of the smaller horned violet. Um, but a lot of times people use them interchangeably. If you just say viola, technically it's correct because it's the genus name. So if you don't know which one to use, use viola. And then finally, we've got a whole host of spring ephemerals that we're working on planting. So spring, ooh, that was weird. <laughs> so spring ephemerals um, are basically small little perennials that come up and do their entire life cycle before the leaves of the trees come out. So they take advantage of that extra sunshine. They leaf, they flower, and then they sort of go dormant for the rest of the summer. They kind of take a hiatus from that heat and humidity, much like the owners of the estate did, which is why they made the ravine garden for spring and fall. Um, so we have things like sanguinaria, which is the blood root, a couple different kinds of trillium, ludium at the top, grandifolium there. Uh, Katie planted some cypress Pediums, which is a native orchid. Um, we have Dicentra, the Dutchman's breeches at the bottom. Chandler talked about the Martensia virginiana, the Virginia bluebells. And then we have the um, Primula media. It used to be Dodecathion media, but they recently lumped it into Primula. Um, I know I ran a little over time, so I'm going to skip the question portion for now, but I'll stick around if you have any questions for me. But I do want to give a quick thank you to our photography team and that volunteer, Tom Muller, who provided a lot of the photography for this presentation. Um, everything else was shamelessly stolen from the internet because, you know, millennials. Um, and yeah, I hope that you enjoy. I'm going to give it back to Chad to do a few extra announcements. I'm not going to try to keep up with Jamie, but um, unfortunately, Chris Moorhead was not able to be here today. He's uh, still sick, uh, but I just want to go through a couple things that he wanted to talk about with volunteerism. Um, the uh, total of active number of volunteers, 659. 
almost 200 new volunteers. Um, this was for fiscal year seven, 17, so this was last year ending. Uh, and then um, 50,000 hours, that's a 237% increase um, over the year before. A lot of this I know was uh, winter lights, but also bulb planting, bulb removals, the garden work that you guys have done, and also guiding. Um, uh, the fill rate, I think that's probably one of his uh, most cherished numbers right there is 83%. I think most normally 70% is a high number that you can get for a fill rate. Um, we're running at 83% right now. Um, and he is gearing it more towards seasonal. Uh, this is a shot from Winter Lights. I hope you all came out to uh, take a look at that. Um, from orchids in 17, you can see the number of shifts he had and the hours and the fill rate. And then um, spring last year, they jumped up quite a bit on the, how many shifts that we were looking for. Again, another 70% fill rate. Winter lights, this was the big one. 824 shifts, 4,000 hours, and a 98% fill rate on that. So everybody is really pitching in and doing incredible things. So orchids this year, pretty close to the same, a little bit better fill rate. Um, spring, this is what uh, Chris is looking for for this year. Right now, we already have a 46% fill rate on something we haven't even started yet. Um, but I would urge you, and I'm gonna go a little bit through a map just quickly uh, to talk about how he's orienting people. Uh, this, these are gonna be informational guides that you can see. This is the map that Jonathan showed earlier with the highlights of uh, the spring that you'll see. Um, he always talks about being a host, which Jonathan touched on this earlier. Um, you're a host when you're here volunteering, when you're working. Staff feel the same thing. The whole idea is to be um, a, a series of excellence and thinking about hospitality. So trying to uh, trying to highlight all of the assets that we have. Um, let's see here. Uh, you can talk to Chris about the ambassador program, so it's a little bit higher level uh, with the volunteer program to get a little bit more detailed. He has uh, volunteer leaders to where uh, you have more responsibilities, but also uh, get to see a little bit more of the behind the scenes and get more information than most other people do. Uh, I would encourage you to do that. Uh, information guides are what he's gonna be setting up around the property. Let me see if I can get to the map. So you can see that he's got uh, ambassadors here, uh, both in the entrance pavilion, in the galleries, just outside in the garden entrance, and then throughout some of the, uh, the gardens. And then, here are the information guides. So we'll have them at the Garden for Everyone, uh, right before the Four Seasons. Here is what we have always called the Hosta Curve. Now they're calling the Hub. Uh, it, it, it is a connecting point, so it does make some sense. And then right here again at the Border Garden, so that you can send people down to the Border Gardens or to the house or to the Beer Garden. So it's a, a pivotal spot. So they've really worked, uh, Lindsay Holstein and uh, Chris have both worked to try to find the best spots to give our, our guests the best information and also uh, uh, keep them uh, moving in the right direction. So here's another example of all of the uh, different scenarios he has with different uh, lead volunteers and staffing. Uh, some of the staffing are gonna be volunteer services, but a lot of these, I think he's having 20 per day volunteers on the weekends for just informational guides. Um, if you happen to are not guiding one day and you would like to work as an informational guide, I would highly encourage that. Um, <clears throat> if you're here to give a tour and uh, nobody shows up, it's not, not likely in the spring, but sometimes in the summer once the heat comes in, I would encourage you to go out into the gardens and share the knowledge that you have. You guys really put a lot of time and effort into learning this uh, historical material, 
plant material, the guests love that. They, that's something that's probably my, one of the great things that I love about public horticulture is while you're working, people come to ask you questions and you can actually intrigue them and interest and get, gain their interest. Uh, we talked a little bit about the hours. Um, he is really, there are some shirts that uh, Estelle had outside. He's really uh, pushing you to wear the shirt. Ideally, uh, he's got magnetic badges or your lanyard. That's something that uh, he really wants to see is the, uh, is the lanyard and or the uh, magnetic badge it's like this that just says uh, volunteer or shift leader. Um, how you can get in touch with Chris. If you, obviously, I think most of you have been in touch with Chris, but if you're brand new to this, I would encourage you, you really need to go through Chris first before you come, become a garden guide because he need, you need to go through our normal volunteer orientation before you get into the volunteer guide section. Um, and I can't express enough about how important it is to check in and check out on the volunteer logistics system that they have. Uh, that is really key for us to track ours. Um, they use it for grant purposes, and uh, but we use it to be efficient. So I want to know how many people it takes, or how many hours it takes to plant 130,000 bulbs or 30,000 annuals in two weeks. I need to know that so that I can budget and get the right number of people and staffing and everything else. So you tracking your hours is critically important to uh, the, all of Newfields. So a little bit more information about uh, how to get in touch with Chris. Um, just a couple things that I want to mention uh, before we split out. Um, Oren is going to be doing a tour at 1230. Are you meeting in Ephraimson? In front of the gift shop at 12.30 if you're interested in uh, going up into the galleries and talking about the connections between art and nature. Um, I just saw uh, when I was passing in today, they are setting up the garden highlights table again. So this is what's in bloom every week. Jamie's changing that out twice a week of what's going in bloom in there. So take a look at that. Please sign up for the tours as Estelle has sheets out there now, but also she'll send you invites through uh, email. I would encourage you to sign up for those as quickly as possible. We have some additional tours this year for Westerly, the director's residence over here in Golden Hill. We're going to be doing some uh, garden tours in there. Um, again, the, both manuals have been updated for the gardens and the park. If you don't have one, you can uh, get with Estelle or Darlene and they can uh, get you set up with one. Um, oh, and one other mention, I put a couple dates at the bottom of your itinerary about Hello Spring starting April 7th. Perennial premiere is April 28th. This year, April 28th, the per perennial premiere will be right here on the mall, on the Sutphin Mall, right in front of the fountain, instead of back at uh, the Scholar's Residence where we've had it past few years. So that'll be right there. Um, we also have the Horticultural Society auction, our affiliate, uh, that's open to the public. It's June 10th. There is a uh, beautiful silent auction, great place to get some plants and uh, visit with like people. One that I did not have on there is the August 25th date for Day of Flight. That's our yearly uh, program where we do hummingbird banding and songbird banding, and we'll have live flights from uh, raptors. We'll talk about keeping honeybees. We talk about butterflies and their life cycles and all of that. You'll hear more about that later on, but that's August 25th. Any questions? I know you've been bombarded with a great deal of information. Don't get overwhelmed if you're a new guide. You're going to work into this and uh, start slow with the, one of the tours that are kind of set up for that. Yes? Yes, that's great. You will. You will have a lot more tours. And all of those, that document that you're talking about, that's 
uh, due to Jamie being able to <laughs> disseminate information and, and, and help us help the whole new fields get on track with how things are proceeding. So thank you. Yes, Alonka. Um, I believe, is it true, Estelle, that that's going to be in the volunteer room, that he's going to have copies? These are really great tools to keep us up to date weekly on what is blooming. So, um. And then another new guy that I think uh, Chris may end up having is he's going to have iPads. He's working on this that hopefully we can get our uh, manuals on there and then some of these files on the uh, iPad so that when you're out and walking around, you can take a look. We haven't, that hasn't been nailed down those tools will be there. And then on that, the swag, as Chris calls it, like the, the t-shirt, the bag, the badge, the lanyard. Chris doesn't want you to wear it all at once. <laughs> <laughs> Don't wear it out. And also there are warm jackets in there for volunteers and umbrellas. Yes. That you can grab and use. Any other questions? Yes, um, it's a family day program that they're doing the International Day of Flowers. Um, so um, that is set up, I'll have to get with you on the exact locations of where um, we're going to have you stationed, but it's more of providing information about, um, it's kind of a, we've done tree passports in the past where kids will come around if they get to a tree and then you kind of stamp them. They're going to be doing similar things with flowers in uh, three different locations. So if you're a shadow and, and Warren, Warren had given you a stamp of approval, you could, you could be one of those, mm -hmm. those uh, guides on that day. And we'll send out another email to get more specifics on that. Because that's not very long. No, that's a little more in a week, so two weeks out. Anything else? Thank you very much. I know it's a long day. Please be safe. Thank you for coming in on such a snowy day.